The short definition of computer vision is when a computer or a machine has sight. To get a little more technical, computer vision is the process of recording and playing back light fragments. The importance of computer vision is in the problems it can solve. It is one of the main technologies that enables the digital world to interact with the physical world. Keeping in mind the importance of computer vision, we have come up with this computer vision tutorial. Now before we start off with the session, I'd like to inform you folks that we have launched a completely free platform called as Great Learning Academy where we have access to free courses such as AI, cloud and digital marketing. So let's get started. That we talked about last week was how exactly sampling takes place here yeah so if there is an image i hope everybody is very clear if i say image is 16 megapixel or if i say image is 2 megapixel or if i say image is 64 bits image for example or 644 bits or 64 bits or whatever what does it mean is here there are more pixels it means the array that is holding this is pretty big it is of size 16 mega and here the size is very less so there is a problem in your current project what is the size of the image the size of the image is 32 cross 32 or what do you, what do you have taken 120 yeah, 32, 32. 32 cross 32 is the size so 32 into 32 is what one one zero two four yeah so it is okay for me to build a neural network which can take 1024 neurons as an input and which can you know do up and down of these things and finally give me a classifier as an output it's okay not a problem correct but what if now this was 16 mega so when i multiplied these two it became 16 mega now is it possible for you guys to handle this yes or no can I have a 16 mega input neural network? Memory problem. It'll be a memory problem. It'll be a computation problem, cost factor. You know, a lot of things comes into picture. Agreed? So in this case, what do we do is we don't go ahead with simple MLP or FCNN. Guys, what is MLP? Multilinear perceptron. Correct. Multi-linear, uh, multi, sorry, multi-layered perceptron. Okay. Which is nothing but another name of FCNN itself. Okay. So please don't get confused. I have seen many, uh, uh, many people, they say MLPA and FNN and all, they mean the same thing. Perceptron is nothing but a neuron. Whenever a neuron goes into hidden layer, that becomes a perceptron. God knows why, but this is what it is. Okay, now this becomes very difficult to compute. So now what are we doing is, what if I can, we just saw, we had a Python code, beautiful Python code we, we are writing. We are, it is working good. What we did, we went on to a new software or especially me, went on to a new software and we got a diminished version of it, which serves the, which does the exact job as what it does. I will say not as effective as this, but yes, at least, I can see if even if I'm achieve, able to achieve 70% of what it does. I'm very helpful. Why should I code? I should directly do this. Why should I waste my time on coding? Agreed, everybody. So same thing you can imagine about images. What if I don't want to take scan the whole image? So let us say this is an image. And uh, there is one person standing in the image. Okay. Let's ignore my drawing. Okay. Yeah, let us say this is a person, then there is a flower over here. There is a flower pot over here and uh, say there is one picture. In that picture again, there is an image. Okay. Something like that. Let us say we have this. So if I ask you guys, what is the information that you guys can derive out of this? You will definitely tell me that there are three spots of information. First is there is an object which is a frame there is an object which is a flower there is an object let us say which is a pot there is an object which is a face that's it you can derive out of it. let us say you've got four so if you tag this up if you remember what do i mean what, I, what do i mean by tagging your current project has got taggings agreed 
here also we have taggings i will say uh, uh, object i will say person i will say object object okay now there is chances if you have designed it very nice it will detect a person out of this also yeah <clears throat> so if i want to do this i do not have to scan these other empty parts i hope you people are getting it i don't need to scan this what if i design small filters okay what are these filters these filters are some random filters like your random weights that you have chosen or we have seen usually let us say these are some weights uh, some filters which when you multiply with the whole image we are able to get a diminished version of this whole thing so there is a possibility that what if i multiply multiply this filter to this okay and i will get one i will get lot of diminished feature maps like this i can call this as a feature map i can call this as a feature map feature map feature map now what if i use this as one image now this could be around say 4 cross 4 image for example what if i could use this into my fully connected neural network to do a classification what if i could use this separately this separately this separately this separately so i need to run my fully connected neural network 1 2 3 4 5 times to identify these five objects agreed so rather than running neural networks megapixel times i'll try to find out some features so that i will be able to classify them yes krishna clear perfect so this is what is your neural network a uh, sorry convolution neural network and this is what we are going to do down the line so in convolution neural network so whenever i say filter you people should completely remember understand that we are talking about convolution post this there are a lot of things i will show you down the line and always a convolution neural network is backed up by a fully connected neural net so this is not leaving us anyway so whatever you guys have done in the first session or first module will remain with you guys through this complete if uh, convolution module okay perfect so now moving on what are the other things i was talking about so i will just show you directly that particular page okay let let me be fair now let me not be rush because we have got good amount of time today so these are my filters which i am giving it to my image yeah so my white portion i have named it as minus 1 and the colored portion where one is written i have put it one when i multiply i am going to get a diminished version of this so if you want to see what do i mean by diminished version this 9 3 cross 3 which is nine numbers i have diminished to one number called 0.33 if you still want to understand how it does it i'll show you one small gif which does it guys just observe the the gif on the right hand side a 5 cross 5 matrix is now diminished to 3 cross 3 matrix with one convolution everybody is okay with this how we got this one number i will show you it's a formula very simple formula manual multipl multiplication is needed here okay so yeah so this is what we have done good now when we did this we got three matrices like this okay post that this matrix whatever we got we will transfer it to an activation function say relu now as soon as you pass through relu you people know that zeros and anything below zero will be omitted remaining whatever is left will be processed over here so now i have got this as an output and whatever i have hidden that means it will be moved out of this matrix negative numbers moving on there is a technique called pooling max pooling or average pooling that i do i st i'm still not happy with this i want to still diminish this image so this is now i will say 7 cross 7 image now i will say the size of my filter was 2 cross 2 so in this case i will do a max pooling on this i will say find out the maximum features out of this four maximum number out of this four obviously it will be one do it this is called max pooling so the whole 2 cross 2 matrix now is represented by 1 cross 1 that means i am dividing the whole matrix by 4 agreed guys simple instead of max pooling you can even do average pooling average pooling means take an average of all four of them put it over here all right so do it pass this filter to each and every portion of this matrix and do it 
good so this is what it is so is it always uh, two by two that we have to take no 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 no, no. it is it can be more than that also we have to define that okay. we have to define our max pooling thing but usually we take two by two because it is easy to decide you know and let us say if we take three by three it will be this divided by nine so there is a possibility that we might lose a lot of pixels out of it. Do you agree we have lost some pixels here? Information? Yes. Yes. Now, why is this? So why am I happy with this? One question to all of you. So if you people got this pooling part of it, quick question. What is the use of doing? Like we are already happy. We have already like diminished the matrix. We are happy with it. Our neural network can take it. Still, why are we doing this? Optimization. Sorry? Optimized version of... Uh, uh, yeah, correct, correct. Uh, but why? Still, why I want more optimized? To, to prevent overfitting, kind of? Mm, no, not exactly here. See, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll give you one very simple example. Say, I have, uh, currently I have five batches under me. Okay, all are my AI ML batches only. Now, from this five batch, if I want to, let us say there are four candidates who are the top performers, for example. Huh? Let us say candidate number A, candidate number B, candidate number C, candidate number D, from all five of them, let us say something like that. Now, if I want to represent how a batch looks like on an average, or what is my strength of my batch, can I say I will pull out the best out of these four, max pooling, or I will take an average out of these four and pull out. Correct? Yeah. So what does it mean is this particular four things when they come together, they kind of represent a single region. So it could be, let us say, an eyebrow of a person. An eyebrow of a person like this. Okay. Where, where if my scanner has gone onto it or if my, say this is my, I will choose one light color. Okay. Say this is my convolution. Okay. Say, the, for example, we are talking about, say this is a face, okay? Imagine this is a face and um, say these are my eyebrows onto that, okay? Now, what am I doing is, let us say my scanner is currently hovering over one of the eyebrows, something like this, yeah? Now, what if I'm doing max pooling onto this? What does max pooling do? We just saw it will take the best feature out of this. Do I need all the features here? Or do I need the best feature out of this? Can I say here the best feature is nothing but um, the black portion here. Let us take and pull it out. Saying that when I scan through this, I find out this particular location, the color of these images black. Very simple. Note it down. So in future, when you are giving a new image, when this is going through a newer image at this particular location, if max pooling pulls out black, that means this image and this image is perfectly same. Let us say this person, I know it looks scary. Let us say this person has got one, what do you call, mole on his face. And when in future you compare it at this particular location, definitely this mole is going to be there. So it's going to understand that yes, it is a same image. A very high level you guys, I'm still like, we have not dived deep into it. Huh? Just trying to understand you guys that sometimes what happens is when you try to think that, okay, we are removing the pixels, not actually, we are taking the best features out of these pixels. Take it that way. All right. Any questions onto this? But uh, Krishna, we might lose the information, right? And uh, in images, mostly it's like uh, black color is more dominant in any ways, right? Hmm. So if there is anything that is uh, having less information, but also significant information, we might lose it, right? Yes, yes, kind of, kind of, yes. So that's the reason what we do is we strike this, we, we, we make sure that our filter that we have designed here, it goes through, okay, one minute, let me change the slide. Yeah, I will make sure that the filter that I've designed First of all, I'll make sure that I have done a good sampling. I have not done a waste sampling, first of all. And also I'll make sure that my filter goes through almost everything. I don't lose any of this. My filter gets multiplied with everything of it. Okay, so you are kind of right. Yes, 
when we try to diminish something, it happens. But also on the other side, when we oversample it or when we do a good sampling, we will not be losing any pixel in this case. All right. See, why do, what do I mean by sampling? I will give you a very good example. Let me open up an image if we have an image. Uh, yeah. So there are chances that when I do some type of sampling, one pixel could look like this. And also there are chances that when I do very good sampling, one pixel might look like this. Also, if I try to do more sampling, one pixel could look like as small as this dot. So if I have good samples like this, more samples, it will be easy for me to remove certain part of it. It's okay. Because if you observe here, uh, the same color propagates almost through a complete top part of the frame. Agreed? Yeah. So if I remove five to 10 of them, it doesn't matter. Pixels. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I guys be very frank on this. Are you people able to visualize or not? Because if we say like, if we don't question right now, no, then down the line in second and third week, we are not going to go back onto this. So please be very clear onto that. Whatever I'm saying, are you guys able to understand? Amit, Akash. So I just have one question, Krishna. How about uh, the samples? Uh, is it uh, like, because uh, we might have like one lakh of samples provided to us in the data. However, it might be an individual image, which might not give the correct representation of that data could be like, nose is coming on the left or it should be on the right in order for uh, uh, augmentation and uh, flipping and all those things. Uh, so how do we ensure that the samples are right in place as required for our uh, analysis? Because we cannot check all the one lakh images if we are provided with that, right? <laughs> Correct. Correct. So for that, we will, we will see something called metric learning in, in, in one of the weeks. I think it's almost last week of this module where we will try to find out the distance between the two images, how far they are. Similar images, but how far they are from each other. Okay. A very good question, but let's, let's hold on till the last week of it. Yes, we'll cover the first. Sure. But I am clear on this, Krishna. Perfect. Perfect. Because this is one topic where majority of my batches, you know, they, they don't get it that how by filtering or multiplying a filter, we are able to get an image. Okay. Good. Second application I will show why CNN. So if somebody will ask you why exactly CNN. So you can, you can give a very simple example is um, whenever I show you, let us say if you look at a car, if you look at a car and let us say the car has the front part of the car is like this. They are one minute guys, really sorry. <clears throat> Say the front part of the car has got two openings like this. Yeah. And definitely we know what car it is. Let us say this is a BMW, for example. I'll just imagine this BMW. Okay. Yeah. So do you go and check the car? Let me check the wiper. Let me check the steering. Let me check the hood. Let me check the seats. No. Visually, if you want to identify something immediately from the bonnet down the bonnet, when you look at this filters, you'll get to know, okay, this is nothing but a, uh, what do you say, BMW. Also, uh, if you look at the Audi part of it, right in the filter, you might find the four bangers. So definitely this is enough for me to identify image. Same concept, you bring it onto computer vision. You don't need to scan the whole image. If in case you want a generic scanning happening, let us say, um, I, I'll give you a very good example. I am currently working on this project where um, this is for my gated community there where I currently live. So we have got an app called MyGate. And what does this MyGate do is it helps us to track the vehicle. So somebody is coming in our community. It has to report and there is a notification sent to the owner that somebody has come to meet you. Do you allow or not? We say yes. So everything is manual. The watch, the security guard has to know, get the name of the vehicle, get the type of the vehicle, name of the person, a lot of things. Now what we have done is sometimes also we it gets unnoticed because the person who's coming from outside doesn't know. He directly walks into it and security assumes that okay, he's a part of the community. So sometimes they go they go unnoticed. So what currently I'm working now on is let's install two cameras over here. 
okay which will try to snap a picture out of this incoming cars and as soon as they take a snap a picture they should be able to locate where the number plate is and if you remember your current project that you are doing we can easily identify the numbers out of it and from my central database we'll get to know whether this is this car belongs to the community or is not in the community if it is not in the community the gate let us say over here should not there could be an automated gate which will open or close because of this triggers for example okay so so far i am able to identify so if i take a webcam and run around through the cars we are i am able to get the number plates so i will show you guys shortly uh, once you guys understand what i'm talking about so probably second or third week of this session i will show you this where we'll take a webcam and we'll try to identify objects out of them okay good so this is what it is so uh, what i what i wanted to show you guys here is sometimes in computer vision you don't have to identify the whole image you just have to focus on certain part of the image that's all if you get it do it and how do we do it cnn will help us to do it in cnn we don't scan the whole thing we don't need the whole thing as an input we scan certain parts of it and we take it as an input and sometimes some of the parts are perfect image that we want good so this is one example of cnn i will give you one more example where this is used Nowadays, uh, if you go to these metro cities, there are malls, in malls there are parking lots and now right in front of the gate itself, the display, how many slots are empty on which floor, which level and what size. Good. So earlier what they used to do is they used to put sensors over here. So if there is a weight on the thing, it is, it is car, there is a car, if not, there is no car. Actually, the sensors are very costly and during maintenance and all, they get destroyed. They have to embed it such a way, very sophistication has like has to be followed over here. So now what they do is very simple. They put a camera. If they find some other color over here, that means there is a car present. The way, the slot is not empty. The counter will be zero. What is this? This is called semantic segmentation. This is your week three content that we are going to do. We don't care what it is. We just see that there is one background color and there is some different color on the top of that. Done. Over. This is occupied. I don't need to know what car it is, what color it is, what shape size it is. That's not our application. Good. So this is where convolution neural networks will come to our help. Good. Now coming on to the weekly content. So this was a little extra. Oh, so all we do is we take the image, we go through convolution, we go through relu, we go through pulling. Again, we go through convolution, relu, pulling. If you still want more, you can go through normalization, 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 your wish. Okay. After this, what did we get? There are two layers of convolution I did. What did we get? A bigger was converted into a smaller. Now, next, what to do? Next, flatten them up and push them on the fully connected neural network. That's all is your CNN. This is your flattened data and just ignore this 0.66 means 0.55 actually it's an excel screenshot so <laughs> it did not uh, it did not do decimal adjust over here okay so 1.55.41 1 they are flattened completely and that flattened thing goes here and you know what happens here and how we classify over here that's it that's all is your convolution neural network and when you bundle all of these together this is how it looks like image convolution pooling convolution flattening and your uh, fully connected neural network mm -hmm. or mlp mm -hmm. whatever you call it. so uh, krishna i have a question how many convolutions and pooling should we do correct is there so, any recommendation or how how do we determine when when to start doing the flattening yes so there is a formula we are going to see down the line which will help us to do this but frankly speaking i will tell you um what you have to do is you have to determine what should be your input here first of all and from there we will go down the line okay so if you want say 64 inputs that means your flat end should be 64 and if let us say you are having um, um say 10 uh, features over here let us say 10 windows over here now each window should be what if you divide 64 by 10, you will get 6.4, which is not a good value. So what in that case, what you do is you make it 8, for example. So 8, 8 is 64. So it could be uh, 2, 
cross, uh, cross four each one. Or you can say two cross two many number of times. I think uh, two cross two, four, four to the eight. Uh, I think eight number of times. Good. I'll show you down the line how to do that. Don't worry. Hey Krishna, can you repeat it? I, I don't think I got that. The... See, what do I what do I, what what was the question here was how many times I should do this plus yeah. what should be the size of each filter and all, all the stuff. So it completely depends on my input first of all. So what you are planning here. So let us say you are planning an input of 64. Right. If your flattened data is 64, what 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 how many filters I should have? This is what the question is. Yeah. So how do we devise this now? So take the reverse engineering concept. Let us say if my each filter is two cross two in nature. So two cross okay. two means how many numbers I have? Four. How many more I need? 16 fours are 64, right? No. Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. 16 fours are 64. Right. So in that case, I need 16 of these. Two cross two. Okay. Yeah. So now go reverse. If I need 16 of this, how much should be my previous value? How much should be my previous value? We'll keep expanding. I'll, I'll show you down the line, but this is what majorly we do it. Uh, okay. Also, one hint for all of you is very less models we are going to use this. We are going to use ready-made models, VGG, AlexNet, uh, GoogleNet, MobileNet, ResNet, RNN, sorry, not RNN, RCNN. We have ready-made models, huge, big models, which, which can handle values up to 6 million parameters. Very few places we are we are going to do this, okay? Because now no, we don't want to take burden of this. Something like our KNIN crime tool today. We already have ready-made models by some of our famous companies. Why not to import it and use it? Okay, good, perfect. So overall, the whole module, what you will do, you will you will be given an image. You will be should be able to identify first of all the image. You should be able to detect the image first of all. And post detection, you should be able to identify it what it is. It can be a car, dog, human being, cat, object, anything which I give you, you should be able to do it. So uh, just uh, what do you say, um, overview to all of you, this session or this module will be around uh, seven to eight weeks to be very frank. It has got two projects into it back to back. The first project will come after your fourth week where you have to detect an object. You have to create a boundary around the object. And the second project is you have to check whatever you have created boundary around what it is, what type of object it is. Good. So by the end of eight weeks, I will say, or else two months, you should be able to be good at computer vision. You should be able to at least implement basic level of computer vision on your, from your side, from scratch. Plus something extra from my side, I will show you simple versions of this. I don't want you guys to go and code huge. It's good, nothing wrong, you do it. But also what we do on industry side, I will show you smaller codes, we use ready-made models to do it. Plus I will show you something extra, which is not covered here, which is called video, uh, uh, what is image identification, continuous image identification, CIA, yeah? So that could be a very good uh, application, especially if you are from, uh, manufacturing industry, building industry, or I would say majorly on the construction industry. Some, some last time I gave you some examples from my side on the testing industry. So still we are exploring how to use this, this opportunity. Okay, good. Especially if you are from retail and uh, manufacturing, this will help you a lot. I'll tell you frankly, I currently uh, interviewed for one of uh, the startups who, who were into um, I will say manufacturing and they are, they were from a QA team. So they've got a very big project from one of these large automobile manufacturers where they want to pinpoint from their, uh, what do you say, manufacturing line, which product is defective just by looking at the image from the camera. So let us say there could be a lot of high definition cameras attached. Earlier, what these guys used to do is they used to pass this stuff from UVs or they will pass a laser light to check the deformities and all. But now looking at the image itself, they want to predict it. Okay, a very sophisticated uh, portion of this. Good, so day by day this stuff is going on and it's evolving. So by let us say 
Uh, I'll tell you one more thing. The timeline for computer vision is at least it will take for you guys six months to you know get normal to this and start applying onto real time. So by then you can say this will be a learning curve. So please be very patient with it. It is not a simple concept. Okay, what is it we discussed? Why we discussed because of image size, cost, and all we are doing this. Um, more or less, this is what we saw in my handwritten image where diagram where you have an image you take a feature out of this, convolute it, flatten it up, put it onto a fully connected neural network and get a prediction of it. So if you observe here, we have a prediction called car, truck and van. Yeah, good, all right. How, uh, how I just explained you how we do it. So please remember one thing, this is your static layer, forward propagation layer. This is your forward and backward propagation layer for learning. All right, so this is your classification layer. This is your feature uh, learning layer. <clears throat> so exactly where image processing is used. As I said, a uh, lot of possibilities. One, as I said, could be onto something like object detection in any industry is good. Uh, something like comparison. So nowadays our government is using this uh, you know, to compare images, find out a lot of things. So this is usually used by uh, Interpol, FBI, and all. You would have seen in movies also, where they compare two images and try to find out what is the best match and try to find out where they are and all of things. Third application could be into retail industry, where um, they, let us say there is a product which is displayed on the website and there are a lot of attributes attached to it. Let us say there is a phone. So 2 GB RAM, this, that, and also. There are certain attributes which need to come from the technical person. But there are certain attributes which you don't need to manually type, like color, shape, size, uh, what it is, which company it is belongs to, a lot of things. So those things which can be easily scanned and put, they are automated. So some of my friends working with Amazon, Flipkart, Reliance Trends, and all this, that's what they do. It. They are hardcore into computer vision onto this cloth, uh, what is it, objects. So whatever they see, they put it. So for example, there is a t-shirt, which is displayed, let us say something like that. They can find out it's a v-neck t-shirt, is this color, this, this could be a probable size. Yeah, so some application. And then the final one I will say is onto reinforcement learning. Google car, Google glasses, a lot of examples you can take it up from this. Yeah, so it's a combination of computer vision plus reinforcement learning. Where, what is reinforcement learning? It takes an image and learns it. It does not have to do all this. You know? If it is not in the corpus, it should not reject it. It should try to understand what it is. Good, okay. So these are the applications. Any questions onto this? Anybody wants to know anything more onto applications specific to your industry where you can use it, do let me know. So, Krishna, have you come across any such uh, usage in terms of uh, HR services or payroll services industry? Mm -hmm. Payroll. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. I will not say purely payroll, but yeah, one of my uh, seniors has worked on to one domain. Uh, I'm not sure how relevant it is with your. So, let us say there are a lot of invoices processed, no? Yeah. So from these invoices, they try to pull out the numbers they wanted. So might be you can do something onto your thing. Is, is it yeah, anything related? I'm not sure. Huh? Yeah, so we have some kind of requirement right now in our company, but I don't think it's assessed fully of the capability. Mm -hmm. But it's, it goes like this from the, so we get new clients, right? When, you, when it comes to implementation. Mm -hmm. So rather than going to clients asking them questions about how the current system is designed and what components, payroll components do they have, mm -hmm. we actually scan the employee sample payslips and from that we could determine that these are the components that are there and how they get calculated, uh, the formula and everything gets derived out of that okay. values that come. Okay. But uh, there, it, could, uh, it was a failure earlier. Uh, but uh, if there is something that you have seen from your market uh, industry or someone of your friends have worked in yeah. similar kind of thing, 
Yeah, let, let me show you right away. I've got a very good uh, example for you. Could help you. Okay, I'm not sure exactly what you're looking at. I have worked on to one of these where we try to pull out certain tags or requirements out of a document. So it was something similar to your thing you can say. Just give me a minute. I'll not show you the whole case study because it's, it's, it's a very, it's a part of your next to next, sorry, next module anyway. But give me one minute, uh, module number 10, NLP. I just finished this code. So a good time to see it. If you observe here, I'm able to tag certain words out of this. Yeah. So you can, in your application, I will say you can use partly to identify the text partly as a text processing. And wherever you find a formula or a process or some something which has got functions and all, you can use NLP to find out which, which is the closest it belongs to. So for that, you need to have a very good corpus. Huh? Corpus is a backend data. You need to have all possible formulas. I hope that's what uh, I'm talking in, in, in sync with you. Yeah. yeah what, what I was trying to understand is, is there any way where we can have a mixed kind of database having images as well as uh, the raw data that we get, uh, where, which we were looking into machine learning databases? No. So you need to have two separate corpuses. One is for text, one is for images separately. Okay, and we are, we should be able to correlate this too, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. If you want to work on this, no, do me a favor. Give me some sample data. I'll, I'll not expect the whole data from your organization. Give me some draft, fake data, which you think okay. is in sync with that. Mm -hmm. We can work together on this. Not a problem at all. Okay. I have done something on to text purely, but yes, we can include the images and we can combine both of them and tag it. Up. Okay. I'll yeah? try to get you some sample data. Perfect. So what I do currently is I have done one of these implementations where we scan RFPs. Yeah. And we try to pull out requirements from RFP using uh, image process. So we can, sorry, using text processing. We can say which requirement is a functional requirement, which requirement is a non-functional requirement, which is a business requirement, under functional requirement, what possible they are talking about. Are they talking about automation or they're talking about no functional are they talking about unit whatever it is you know it's very easy to pull this stuff out the only thing is uh, the luckily i've got a good corpus for this yeah so i can do that all right <clears throat> okay it's a shutdown for me one minute guys i'll just restart this okay this is this is one thing anyone else everything is good then yeah all right so let's see what we can, what, what is planned for this particular session is we'll take an image and uh, data structures and types. We'll see to it. What are they? Convolution filters, kernels on an image, convolution neural network versus fully, connect, fully connected neural network, convolution layers, average, max pooling. We'll see this and forward and back prop in CNN. Yeah, good. So I think we've covered almost everything. Now let's see what type of images or what pixels can consist basically. So we can have gray or we can have an RGB, RGB or grayscale. Now if I give you an example, what do you mean by grayscale is in here, the lowest possible value for pixel, let us say zero and the highest possible could be 255. For example, zero could correspond to white, two, sorry, zero could correspond to black. 255 could correspond to pure white and whatever numbers you see in middle will be the different shades that you are seeing here. Okay. Good. Everybody gets this. Yeah. Okay. So now moving on. What about this one? Here also same stuff. Here we'll have three different channels. One is called red. One is called green. One is called blue. Okay. Let me go a little neat. Again, I start scribbling the red, green, and blue. What are the numbers over here? Same thing. Zero could be darkest green, 255 could be lightest green. Yeah, different shades of green you can observe over here. Zero could be lowest uh, blue, 255 could be highest blue. Zero, 255. Now you may ask me, okay, fine, then how do I mix match? How do I get one color? So if it is purely green, we'll pick it up from here. But what if it is a combination of all three of them? In that case, there is a special function which will 
give us a calculation between all three and give us one number which will correspond to one of the color matrices which is stored in our computer under computer vision yeah so if you guys remember there is a special type of plotting function called i am show yeah in that you put any matrix of your choice say create a 64 cross 64 matrix of your choice no problem you put it and try to plot it using i am show it will definitely give you some or other color out of it so what does it mean is there are some predefined values stored in the computer which takes up these values okay so this is what is two things which we'll deal with next moving on what type of images we can see so we have got 2d and 3d matrices what is a 2d matrix a 2d matrix is your m cross n and what is a 3d matrix so i will say grayscale image could be a 2d matrix and the rgb will be a 3d matrix so in that case i will say 32 cross 32 cross 3 that means it is a three channel uh, 32 cross 32 image and if you want to make it 4d i will say if you remember in your model we have 42000 images 32 cross 32 in this is a 4d but don't don't take it up as a 4d you know it's we can we can ignore the first and the last part 32 cross 32 is what we are interested in yeah and please remember pixel is the lowest form in which an image could be represented it depends all on us how we are sampling it if you want more samples that means if your image is 16 megapixels it has more information it is more sharp if the same image has one megapixel you can understand how blur and vague it will be if you want to see how it looks like a very lowly sampled image look at this this is how it looks like each square over here represents one pixel I could have done it in very simple way also each dot over here could represent one pixel in that case what would have happened we could have easily been able to see his eyes nose mouth and beard look at the blurriness okay so if you look at this this is how an image looks like on the back end so this is your front end this is how we give numbers to this image where black is zero anything which towards white is 255 now you can check it out look at this value and look at the darkest value where is it look at this value they're perfectly sync and then you remove whatever it does and this is how it looks like on our uh, python side back end part of it okay what if i want to normalize this i'm not happy with 0 to 255 what happens guys in that case what we do is we divide it with the highest value what will be range? What will be my range now? Can somebody spell it out? If I divide or if I normalize this, what should be my range? Between zero and one. Zero and two. Oh, between zero and one. Very simple. This is how a digital image is processed in the back end part of it. Now, if you want to understand how a filter works, very simple. Just look at one particular corner of this image is being scanned or multiplied by the Im uh, filter this is my filter and once if the filtering finishes this is what we get out of it so a three cross three is becoming one number so i can say i have, I have divided the whole this thing by nine basically totally nine uh, numbers are represented by one number here this is what is my uh, convolution and how does it happen if you observe here very simple minus 1 into 3 plus 0 into 0 plus 1 into 1 like that you do it for all the rows and columns at the end we'll end up with minus 3 some number called minus 3. if you ask me what does this number represent i will say it's just a pattern so when i pick up one feature out of an image the answer for that pattern or that image is nothing but minus three. So tomorrow when you get a similar, you get almost all the numbers similar down the line. To another image, you can say that this image and this image is perfectly same. Future. Okay, perfect. So moving on. Now there is a thin line of difference between convolution and correlation. So just now we were, we were thinking about, okay, what is this filter? How do we decide this filter or not? Again, I will say filter is, let us say, some randomly chosen 3 cross 3 matrix here, for example. 
So what is the difference between correlation and convolution is? In convolution, what I do is, it is in correlation also we multiply, in convolution also we multiply. The only difference here is, every time you want to use a filter, now you flip them. You flip them. You don't use the same filter every time. You keep flipping. Now what do I mean by this? Let me show you an example on this. Let me restart my kernel. So let me take you to that place. Yeah. So let us say this is one image given to us. Okay. These are the filters that I'm going to multiply this image with. So look at, have a close look at this particular filter. This is how it looks like. Now, just see what I, what I do. So when I change, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll show you guys how do I play around with these numbers and all. What I'm doing is, both my extreme vertical ends, I'm making it minus one, minus one, minus one. And whatever middle values are there, I'm keeping it one, one, one. Look at the original image. Now let me run this. At least I need to run this, that's it. Yeah. Now let's try to plot this up. Okay. This is my original image. I have changed my filters. Earlier, if you saw, there was a different filter. It was vertical stuff. Now it is going to become did you observe this guys? Yeah, just by changing certain values in and out, I changed my complete image, how it is interpreted. Look at this. Yeah, so just by changing these filters, I'm, I'm converting this image into this image. One more thing I'll show you. Let us say I divide this by say 14. For example, some random number. It'll be blurred. Okay, one minute, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, 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 minus one, minus one, minus one, okay. Let us try to generate this, see? Yeah, and what if I remove this, for example? Yeah, the complete image is changed. So please remember when a filter changes, definitely the value of your pixels inside the matrix also changes. And because of that, you will get uh, different images. So this is how we play around with images. And this is, a, this is how, what, I, what, we, what we mean by filters. Okay, good. So now let's see this one. Uh, did you people see the implementation in the weekly video onto this or yet to do it? Do you, do, do you want me to do this image processing basics or we know this? No, we don't know this. You know this? Okay. Let's do it. See, very simple thing. Uh, we have seen this uh, Snapchat and uh, what else we have? We have got uh, Instagram and Facebook and a lot of them now, you know, if you just look at it, there will be glasses put on your face or there'll be some cap put on your face or beard and a lot of things <coughs> are happening. And also sometimes it will try to change the color of the image. How they do this? Very simple. Only they have to do is they have to design one filter like this. That's it. Okay, so this is an example of a simple filter. You can imagine they have to design a little bit bigger filter, such a way that they change certain background in and out and they try to understand that this is your face, remaining things is not needed. Okay, so if I multiply this image with this thing, we are going to get this. Now, what is the pattern here? If I multiply this, if I want to sharpen an image, this is how I'm going to get. What is sharpening? You are highlighting the hidden features out of the image. This is what I call it sharpening. If you want to do edge detection, this is how you are going to do it. So you will see only edges over here. Okay, where do you think we need this, guys? Let's try to think about it. 
except this Snapchat and all I say, not, not those examples. Apart from that, anywhere else you are able to visualize, we need this. Or... Mm, augmentation. Okay, perfect. Whenever you want to augment an image in your corpus, you can use this good one. Anything else? Anything else, guys? Okay, uh, let us say we are talking about um, something about uh, into medical industry, for example. In medical industry, let us say you have a snapshot or a microscopic image of a person's uh, cells and they want to detect whether these are cancerous cells or normal cells. In that case, what we do is we pass it through one of these filters, such a way that we get edges like this. And from these edges, we, you know, we might come to know how big is the size of a cell and all those things. Could be one possibility. And I've seen extensively healthcare using this nowadays. Nowadays, even I, the sophisticated hospitals that you know, we go to, they can no need to show the, the, the x-ray to a doctor. Uh, the machine itself tags. Let us say if this is an X ray. Okay, this is, this is an X ray of some part of your body. It basically, it tags itself where is the problem. It auto detects the problem. How? By this kind of machine learning or by this kind of computer vision learning. Okay. Also, I will say not only computer vision, you can use uh, even our uh, KNN and SVM also over here to identify these things. Very simple. Moving on, if you take the image of Lena, this is a very famous model. So when, when I was studying my engineering, all of my textbook had this image. Okay, same image used years on year on years. What is this? Take an image, put a filter onto that. What is this filter? Sharpening filter. Now, is this filter in sync with our earlier filter? Look at this filter, guys. Zero minus one, zero. Okay, and look at our earlier sharpening filter. 0 minus 1, 0, minus 1, 5, 1. Okay. So wherever you go, this filter is going to be same. Now, what if I want to sharpen my image more? What is the possibility what you can change here? Anybody is able to get the pattern? 5 needs to be changed to Let me say 10. Good. Perfect. So just understand the pattern, you will get the processing part. Take this example, edge detection. Now, this edge detection, look at this. And look at our edge detection here. Is it in sync? Not at all. What does it mean is it's not necessary always to follow the same. Yeah. In this edge detection, what we have done is we have highlighted the extreme edges with zeros and ones. And in middle, we are changing it to minus four. Okay. Same thing if you want to more sharpen it, what we are doing, we are converting the complete third row to this zeros to ones and this to two. Here also zeros are converted to minus one, minus one, and this one is two. And these the middle one are all zeros. In that case, you will get a sharpened image like this. This is also sharp, this is more sharp. If I want to go one more level above, I could have done minus two, four, minus two, zero, 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 two, four, two. It would give us a better one one version above the sharpness <coughs> okay perfect so this is what majorly in and out we do want to image processing filtering now you may ask me okay well, fine why did we do this we did this because uh, tomorrow you need to augment your image or tomorrow you want to you know basically compare two images and let us say one of the images in some form other one is in some form what you do is you apply a single filter on both of them so that you bring them to a single level and then you physically compare them one to one or you use distance formula to understand how far are the points okay good perfect so this was your image processing now let me give you an example on this let us say this is one image of me okay let us say this is one more image which I have taken. So this was usually, you know, if you look at our ID cards, I don't know how many of you feel that. I have a six year old ID card from Capgemini. Okay. If you look at my image before six years, and if you look at my image now, this is something like before and after. Something has happened to me because of which this image is in no sync with what I currently look like. <laughs> okay. So let us say this is my 
old image and this is my current image so let us say this is something on my id this is something which live my organization is taken now i want to say this is old and this is current and there could be one more image from a person who looks almost similar to me so i will say this is a positive image this is a negative image positive in the sense it is kind of me negative means i know it is not me what if i take this three separately through a convolution neural network say what if i take this person through convolution neural network okay i will get a set of matrix agreed i take this image i'll get a set of matrix i take this image i will get a set of matrix yeah now what should i do to find out that these two are same where these two are not same i need some patterns right i need some something some function what according to you could be used here facial features sorry facial features yeah but uh, if if you observe here these are nothing but numbers mm -hmm. these are just numbers some matrices so what what algorithm or what i should use here Guys, nice. you remember KNN? What was KNN? Yeah, I know you know KNN. You have to ask me that. But yeah, what does KNN do? Distance? Yeah. Yeah. So what if I find out the distance between these two matrices? Give me one minute. I just have to plug it. Yeah. What if I try to find out the distance between these two? Okay, let us say the distance between these two is alpha. And what if I try to find out the distance between these two? Let us say beta. Now tell me the relationship between alpha and beta. Guys, it's shortest distance. Uh, C. C. When I subtract two similar things, what will be alpha? Can I say tending to zero? Yeah, and when I subtract two dissimilar things, say this will be tending to infinity. Beta. So can I say alpha is always less than less than beta? Yeah, or else can I say like this: alpha minus beta will be always less than less than less than equal to. Does it? come to your okay fine let me not confuse you guys what i was trying to say is please remember at the end of the day these are nothing but numbers you can use any of your machine learning classification techniques to do this here what i did was here i used loss function as distance we can definitely find out the complete distance and we can say which two are nearer which two are farer so if i say if a two images if we say two images are similar i will say let us say the similarity should be around 0.5 so when i subtracted them no let us say i got a value of uh, 0.29 that means the difference between them is 0.29 which is very less as compared to 0.5 i can definitely say that the distance is very less between them but let us say when i compare this with this i got a distance of 0.75 it is above my threshold value so i can say that yes both of the images are different you can use even cnn into that level very simplistic way you don't need to go and do all hi fi stuff always this could be as simple as this this is called matrix learning into cnn okay so this is where you will need all this image processing skills sometimes to alter the data i hope everybody is in sync with me yeah uh amit shakti akash dhruv harish kaushik kranti ragu vishnu are we good yeah perfect all right great so now let's see this case study where um i will say it's not a majorly a case study but yeah a some of the basic concepts which will help you to um to work on this so what do i have i have got uh, numpy i've got sk image Okay, which uh, has a data so there are some images pre-stored and also it will help us to do some kind of io uh, functions okay next um, there are some pre predefined data sets which are stored inside uh, python so in, inside basically sk image one of them is coins data so i just have to call the data coins data and then push it on to image 
and uh, find the type of it. So usually it is a num by array because if you remember, I just said images are nothing but <coughs> a matrix of numbers. Okay, and if you want to see how do they look like, and first of all, if you want to see the shape and size of it, three and then three cross three eighty four is that image, one image. This is how it looks like. So if you want to play around with it, if you want to see uh, what is image zero cross zero has forty seven numbers in total. Yeah, so this is nothing but your forty seven. Also, if you want to print the top, say print uh, stuff from hundred to one fifty on X side. And from Y side, you print some from 25th to the 75th reading. If you do that, and you print it out, you get an image like this, which is one of these, uh, what do you say, uh, coins, okay? Now, CMAP uh, defines what type of image it is. If you want a grayscale image, you can put a grayscale here. If you want a red, green, blue, you have to define reds, greens, and blues. So I have shown down the line, or else let's do it one minute. Okay, so this is my grayscale. Okay, uh, this is my image. So let us say if we say 0, 1, 123, say 0, 7, 1, for example, 130. Okay, so what do we do now is let us say I want to show you a grayscale image. So I will say gray. Okay, In that case I'll get a gray one. If you want a green one, greens. We'll get a green one. Yeah. So these are some manipulations on CMAP. Later on, there is one more set of image called data.coffee. So this is how it looks like. Now look at the dimension of it 400 cross 600 cross 3. That means it is RGB kind of uh, channel. Okay. Next is if you want to, you know, focus more on to the, you know, the, the red part of it. So what I do is I keep the third channel as it is normal and i say reds so for example if i say greens here okay it is going to give me a normal image when it is green how it looks like that's it i'm just changing the filter why because i have not imported the image here okay if i want to make it more greener if i want to focus more on the green part of it so what do i do say i change this okay so if i want to sharpen it basically from the green side so when i print it Look at this. If I want to make it more green, so instead of blue, I say greens. Yeah, it's going to become more sharper and sharper. So this is how we can play around with some of these numbers. Say I want, uh, I want everything, um, or else uh, say I'm not sure. I've never tried this. Let me try from two, from one to three. Say one, two. I never altered the middle one. Yeah, yeah, good. Let's not play around with this. <laughs> yeah, so this could be some some operations you could use it. Next is uh, understanding the the filters that we have shown. So this is one new image, and uh, this particular image, if you observe, if you want horizontal uh, bars, so this is the same image as this. The only thing is we have got a filter here. If you want to sample it or if you want to uh, edge detect it horizontally, the first and the last one, horizontal one should be minus ones, other one could be zero or one, not a problem. If you want to do the same operation vertically, common sense, the first and the last column should be minus ones, other one should be ones, okay? What are we doing basically? We are multiplying this with our image, that's it. Next is if you want to sharpen the, sorry, if you want to edge detect it, properly. So if you, if you go to our PPT, the same filter is used for that camel. Minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, instead of eight. So let us say if I do 16 here, for example. Yeah, we have got back the original image almost. What if I reduce it to two? Yeah, so at eight, perfectly, it detects all the images and it does not show me black and white. You can easily see there's a 3D kind of cubes over here. Yeah. Uh, second thing is if you want to blur an image. So if this is my original image and if you want to blur it like this, what you have to do is you have to multiply or else you can say you have to divide something by 16 and multiply with an identity matrix. 
or I will say not even 16. You can take any number here, say one by five. Definitely you are going to get a blurred image as compared to this. As you keep going higher and higher, your blurness is going to kind of vary. Yeah. Good. So this is what it is majorly onto your image processing part of it. Play around with these images, import your own image and try to play around with these filters and all. You will get to know. <clears throat> now, one quick question is sometimes we are using four cross four filter. Sometimes yeah, we are using three cross three filter. Okay. Do not hesitate to use even eight cross eight. Nothing wrong into it. The only thing is you have to know if you want what kind of feature you want out of it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, there could be many websites where these standard filters are defined. So you can download some of these filters and try to create your own uh, values out of this image. Play around with that. If you're not able to find them on web, do let me know. I'll try to search for it. Okay. Good. So you can do some work on image and understand what it is. Now moving on to something complex now. So let's see how to do all this. Now, how to go ahead and can do convolution out of this. So these all are these all are the basics. Yeah. So just observe the animation that is happening on the right hand side. So on the left, we have got three bigger images where we are convoluting them layer by layer. So the first one was layer one. Now we are doing layer two convolution. And finally, you will observe the green colored cells. These are the final outputs of your images over there. Okay, guys, and also you observe the right hand side how RGB is working onto it. Okay, so any image is nothing but a combination of RG and B, three layered, and finally we are convoluting it and converting them into one particular value. So here four cross four is getting converted into one particular value. So we are convoluting the image. Okay, good. Now, moving on, another simplistic version where you don't need to focus on all of them. So if you observe in our previous animation, we were going cell by cell. So if you see, we did not move anything extra. We are going to almost all the cells. Did you people see that? Yeah. Here, what are we doing? We are not going to all the cells. We are going to some focused areas, for example. Yeah. Now. Uh, how do we do that? There is some factor called stride. If you guys have seen your weekly videos, the professor talks about something called stride factor. What is stride? Very simple. If I have this, uh, say, four cross four image, okay, this assumed this is a four cross four, four cross four image. And if I have, I'll take a red one and I'll take a dark color. If I say I have a two cross two filter, this will be my first filter. If I say my stride is equal to zero, that means I have to immediately go to the next. But if I say my stride is equal to two, so what I will do is, let us say this was, in, initially it was intended like this. Now, if I say my stride is two, I will skip one and two, I will go to the next one. So in this case, it's not possible because it's not there, but what will do it? Just imagine there was one more column. I will skip two cells and move on to the next one. So these are the examples where you can increase the stride and focus only on certain patches of your uh, image. You don't have to worry about the whole thing. Okay, good. So this was your convolution. Guys, anyway, still, this is basics only. I'm just giving, making you comfortable with it. Now comes the real part. How to decide number of filters and this size and that size and all that. So please remember, you see two formulas here. One is called output width, one is called output height. And as I said, we'll go in reverse direction. Okay, so first thing is what output you need from your convolution layer, first question. So let us say from this whole image, if I just focus on this tires and let us say this door, it will be enough for me to identify that this is a bus. Okay, now, that's not a problem here. The problem here is how to decide what filter size I should take about. So the first thing is, I want to say, I want my, I want to understand what will be output. So what you guys do is either you fixate on this or you fixate on this, whichever way you like it. You can, we cannot have both the options. Say I fixate on my 
filter. Say for example, I use two cross two filters four number of times, four filters out of that. My stride is equal to two. That means I will skip two to cells and move on. I don't want to do a very good sampling. Yeah. For that, what I will do is I'll take the width of my image, which is 32. Okay. Minus width of my filter, which I have decided as two. So 32 minus two. So let me do it properly. 32 minus two. One minute. So I will reduce the thickness. Otherwise, I will not be able to write. Width is 32. What is this width? Width of my image. Okay. A minus width of my filter that is 2 plus 2 into padding padding in a sense sometimes the image is not enough to scan because of our filter we just saw when just now when I was trying to do stride 2 it went out so for that reason what you have to do is you have to pad it up pad means add an extra layer of zeros around it in our case we don't need padding so this will be 0 I will say 2 into 0 is 0 divided by stride. What is my stride? Stride is equal to 2. If you compute this, 32 minus 2 is 30. 30 by 2 is 15. 15 plus 1 is 16. This is how I got my convolution layer. Now, why? what I did was I froze this and I got this. What if you freeze this and you can get this? How? It's very simple. You say 16 over here and don't put anything here. So I, 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 the equation will be 16 is equal to 32 minus filter width plus 2 into 0 divided by stride I have set as 2, okay, plus 1. Take everything on the other side, you will get your filter width. So it will be 16 into 2 is 32. 32 is equal to 32 minus filter width plus 1. So I will set 33. Uh, sorry, divided by. Sorry? First, I think you have to take plus one. Ah, yeah, yeah. I did not take the LCM. <laughs> okay, now it's okay. Yeah. So 32 plus 2 is 34. So when 34 goes this side, it will become minus 34. That will be minus 2 is equal to minus of F of W minus minus cancel. So I will say my filter width is nothing but 2, which is nothing but your answer. So whichever way you do it, I'm okay with it. Yeah. You can check it up with this. Guys, quickly check it up. Is it matching here? I will not do it. You people compute it. Both the ways. Just check it out. Is it matching? Are you able to do it? Padding is zero in this case. Okay. So don't take padding factor. Yeah, matching. Matching, right? Good. So what if I would have taken three cross three then? Can somebody tell me the output uh, layer width? What three cross three? Filter. The filter here, instead of 2 cross 2, let us say I have taken 3 cross 3 as a filter. Now what will be my output width? Will you need padding first? Yeah. So that's all. Take it out. How will we do it? It's an odd number. So can't compute. Hmm. Okay, uh, 32 cross 32 is too big. Let, let me not confuse you guys. Let us say this is a, um, let me put some, some, some brackets over here. Say one, say two, three, four and five, okay? Similar to that one, two, Three, four, and five. Good. Now, what should be my filter size? Such a way that, or else I will give you the filter size. Let us say three cross three is my filter size. Can you people tell me the output form? What output I'll get? What cross what? Use that formula. I'll give you five minutes. Just check it out. It, it, it'll be good, guys. You'll be able to, you know, visualize the same thing in your convolution also because we have to put hyperparameters there, right? What should be the width? What should be the size? Five minus three plus one. Okay. Five minus three. Okay. Plus one. Padding should be one. What? No, zero. 
zero, right? So five minus three divided by two. So that is two by two. Okay. That is one. Okay. So what will be the answer? I want m cross n. You guys can type it out. Not a problem. Type me on the chat. I'll I'll put the formula for you guys. Output width okay is equal to the width of your image. Okay, there's a lot of noise, lot of noise. Lot of noise. Guys, please mute up. Still a lot of noise. One minute. Who is it? Yeah. Okay. So width of the image minus filter width plus two times padding divided by stride factor plus one. This is the formula for output width and output height, both the same formula. Now tell me guys, what will you do? You have to decide on padding, you have to decide on stride, how will you do it? Stride should be one, stride should be two, what it should be? Yeah, if padding is zero and stride is two, okay. then output is two cross two. Okay, so one answer I got is two cross two. Okay, perfect. So did you see five cross five image? Now we've got the best features out as two cross two. Okay, next, anybody else? Change the padding and st uh, stride. Check it out. See guys, what, what, what here the roof said was, he doesn't want to do any change in the padding and also doesn't want any stride. So sorry, stride is what, Dhruv? Two, right? Okay. In that case, you can say this is one, uh, three cross three. And if stride is two, one and two, it will come here as three cross three. Then in the next layer, one and two, it will come like this. Agreed? And it will come like this. So do you people agree it's a two cross two? Perfect. One, two, three, four. Because he has taken stride as two. What if the stride was not two? Then in that case, what will be the answer? Let us three say stride is one. Three cross three. Three cross three, exactly. So you will get more features, three cross three. What if you take a padding through? What if there was a padding there? Let us say I take a padding of, uh, I take a padding of padding and two stride, it gives three by three. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So now I hope you are able to get it. It is not always necessary that to pad or to have more strides and all. It all depends on your filter. So you baseline one of them. Either you baseline this or baseline this and then choose the other one out of it. I will always say baseline this. Easy way. Okay. Is everybody in sync with me? Everybody got this, guys? From next week, we'll not be able to discuss all this, okay? So when I say something I've taken in the code, you people, you people should be able to identify what is uh, uh, stride, what is padding, how I've taken this decision, okay? Padding and stride are high. So, I'm with it. Yeah, kind of, yes. Anything else, guys? Any, anybody wants me to repeat? No? All right. If padding is one, then what will be the effect on actual image? See, if padding is one through padding is like putting zeros. So you will, you will get one extra white colored patch onto that. That's it. I will say padding personally is not good, but sometimes our images are of some odd size. No, to match up the filter, we have to do padding. Correct. Okay. Yeah. It is like a fake white colored layer. Unwantedly pasted onto that. So, Krishna, padding would be uh, would be used if the image is not like uh, in square in shape or something. Correct, correct, agreed. So here we have taken five cross five. Now, what if it was five cross six? So let okay. let's try that out. And guys, remember, right, it's very difficult to visualize all this. So don't strain yourself if you say, okay, I'm not able to get it. Definitely, one shot will not be able to get it. Say this is one, two, three, say four and five. Okay. Now, if this was five cross, uh, say three, for example, one, two, and three. Okay. Now, my intention here is to use a three cross three filter. Is it possible, first of all? Just check it out, guys. A three cross three filter, how it look like. So let me increase the thickness. 
So it will be 3 cross 3. Yeah. And if I say stride is equal to 1, now what's going to happen? To have one more 3 cross 3, do I have space? No. So in that case, what I have to do, I have to add one extra padding layer on the whole image. Okay. So usually you will see in all the codes is usually by default, they take a padding of one or two. It's okay. Because we are not sure sometimes we will not be able to visualize this. So it's okay to take an extra padding doesn't matter. Sometimes we don't do it. If we don't do it, if it is an issue, it will throw an error anyway, it will notify. Us. So once it notifies us, either we change the size of filter or we change the size of image immediately. Good. Vishnu is okay now. Yes. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so moving on now. So this is very important. Please remember So when I share this, keep it with you and this is very handy also. It's not a big deal. Okay, so this is what is padding. What it will do is it will unwantedly add an extra number. Usually it is zeros. So it will not impact as much if we do pooling. Because if you remember what is pooling does is pooling will pull out the best feature. So if I pull, let us say, sorry, if I pull, let us say out of this, anyway, the zero is going to be ignored somehow. Okay, so it will not affect much, but at least it will not hinder us from uh, doing. Uh, um, yeah, next is pooling layer. So we have two types of pooling available. I will not say that's it. You can have your own version of pooling also, but these are the most popular ones. Max pooling, average pooling. <clears throat> so average in the sense you take average of all four of them and you pull as one number. Max is, take the max of it. So in this case, it will be one, one, two. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, guys, one more thing. Sorry. This is the max pooled image. From here, it is got. So if you see 20, 30, 37, and 112. This is how we got. If you still want to max pool this further, then answer is 112. Okay. I did not see that. I'm sorry. This is coming from here. Okay. This one also, if you observe, average pooling. So take an average of the first one. Let's check whether it's in sync. 20, so 32, 40, 52, 52 by 4. Okay, it's 30. All right. So, what else we can do? Anybody? Any idea? We can use any other computation. You could do min pooling too. I mean, since we're doing max. Mm, I mean, see, here we want to extract the best features. For min pooling, you're saying we'll extract the worst features. Uh, okay, if, if in case we can blur an image, let us we can do that. Okay, let's see. Let's, let's see that. I've never tried it out. Okay, let's see that. But yes, if you want to spoil an image, if you want to spoil certain part of an image as a blur part or something, yeah, you can take that mean value also. Good one. Uh, anything else out of this four? Can we take Sorry? mean max? Min max. How do we do that? Or we can take a kind of maximum value minus the mean. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Let us say twenty. Uh, in this case, it will be uh, the twenty minus uh, seven. Okay. Nothing wrong. Yeah. But you have to design your own. At least it will not be present in the standard uh, function. So you design your own function. The standard values are these two, max pooling or average pooling. Good. So that's it. Yeah. So now how it looks like. So I fully connected a layer. So what do we have? We have got your input. Hey, one one yeah. quick question. Yeah. So where do you use max pooling versus average pooling? I mean, how do you make that decision? Okay. See, uh, use max pooling on two. Uh, let us say you have a low, low uh, sampled image. So let us say the sampling here is two megapixel, for example, and the sampling rate here is 16 megapixel. In that case, what's going to happen is the images which are nearby, no, will be almost similar itself. So in that case, you can take an average, not a problem. But if you feel the sampling of your original image is not that great, you do max pooling, except the best out of this feature. Okay. Okay. See, I'll tell you why. Let let's let's go back. Are you uh, are you saying that if the image is higher resolution, huh. then go for uh, average. Average, and if it is lower resolution, then go for max. Okay. Correct. See, if you look at this one, okay, 
this is only two, two uh, zero or one, or I'll say black and white. So now, if I have a filter which is focused onto this, which one you think is of our importance? Guys, max play or min, uh, average? Back. Max, correct? We need to know where there is a black uh, pixel. Definitely, we are going to get this. So, this for two cross two image now is represented by one, which is called black, which is nothing but black in number. Now, let us take one more example. Say, for example, you are having your stuff into this. Now, what is maximum number over here? All of them are ones. So, if you do max pooling onto that, what you will get? One. Or if you do, let us say, average onto that, what you will get? Averages? Three by four. Three by four. On yeah? seven. Correct. So you can do this or you can do this. So anyway, the answer is, we got to know that majority of the features over here are one and six. Yeah. We know that. So this is some example of average. This is an example of max. So I think... The other difference is if you do average pooling, then uh, especially where, uh, for example, you have four, four black. Hmm. I think that uh, difference between the different uh, values would be would be more of a range. Okay, would, let's would, take would, let's take an example. Say where do we get four? In here we don't have it. So let us say we we take something like this. Mm, yeah, we take something like this, three cross three. Yeah. Okay. So if you take an average of this, yes, I agree with you. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Works out. So we have got one, two, three, four, five. Five divided by nine. That will be our um, average. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Okay. Good. So it's, guys, you understood what is he trying to say? He's trying to say that you will exactly get the number. How many blacks are there? How many whites are there? That's it. Pi by nine. So the top denominator is nothing but your total number of whites available out of nine. Yeah. So the reason I asked that is, so it, in a sense, you are getting more information, right? Into the next uh, layer right? or in the, into the next. Uh... Correct. Correct. So we are basically taking the best information out of this and moving ahead. Here, in our case, guys, best information means black. Worst information means white. That's it. You don't want white out of this. Now, are you guys comfortable a little bit with the filter part? Now, you get the point why we need filters, what filters can do and what max pooling will do. We just need the best feature. We don't need extra background stuff from this image. Let's not do it. Good. So this is one way to represent an image. If you want a little bit more simpler version, you can do this. What I feel this image is a better representation of where you can take out certain features out of an image and directly classify that it's a car, truck, or van. This is this could be a we'll, we will see this little little later in, in in our course. We don't need to go and scan everything. Certain features will take it out completely. Okay. Good. So this is an example, I will say, of uh, RCA then, Regional Convolution Neural Networks. We will see down the line. This comes in around the fourth, third or fourth week. Good. So we have done almost uh, everything which was needed. So next session, what I will do is that we will start with uh, implementation of the CNN and then we'll move on to a very simple topic called transferred learning. So just to give you guys a very clear a quick five minutes idea on to next week's videos. Don't worry, those uh, VGG, LXNet, FlexNet, then uh, ImageNet, ResNet, all those nets that are produced, no? They are produced by some people which who have done a lot of com permutation combinations to find out the best combinations of convolutions here. You know what it does? It basically, whatever image you give, no, it tries to classify you properly. Now, what has happened since these neural networks have one certain computations, they are standardized now. What does it mean? Their weights are stored in an HDF format. Now on what you can do is you can build up your code. You can download their weights. You can re ready the architecture for them. You can automatically download their weights. 
and you can build your own FCNN at the end. So whatever you download, no, that will be only convolution neurons. The last layer, the last three to four layers that we are supposed to do, our own layers, that is your fully, fully connected neural network layer, is what you have to design. That's it. Your network is ready. You don't have to take a pain of building your own CNN. This is called transferred learning. That's all is the topic for next week, whole week. So which Good. The waves are already initialized? Yeah, already. Not already initialized, I'll say. The weights are already ready. The filters are already ready. All you need to do is pull it down and then rerun. See, it's like you cannot train them. You can train this. So when you do your fully connected neural network, when you train your model, these are non-trainable static stuff. This will be your trainable stuff. That's it. Do you think our problem will be solved? Yes, right? You don't have to take a pain of designing a very complicated neural network. Neural network is good, I, I, we get it. But you don't have to take a pain of designing all this. You are getting this ready-made, this part. This one, what you are supposed to design. And you people are very good at this now. Got it? This is called transferred learning. It's like one of you design a code, generic code, and give it to all of us. We just change the input data and run it as our classification model. That's it. So don't get confused if the professor is showing LXNet. LXNet is very big. You just have to understand that this is a ready, ready stuff. We are importing it and running it on our model. So that I don't have to go through a pain of training my own model. And usually the parameters are something like 6 million, 10 million, 16 million parameters. That's the reason we don't need to train them. We have to directly get them. Ready-made codes. Krishna, right. can, you, can you explain with an example? I mean, um, so would you say that maybe uh, you have a corpus of vehicles, right? Yeah. So you, you would get uh, kind of a model which is which already can identify vehicles Correct. because it, it has learned, it has gone through a corpus and hmm. um, then you just add maybe a few more layers on that just to look at uh, maybe if you if your problem is to identify a Ford vehicle, then you work on that. Is, is correct. that a... Correct, correct. See, uh, Vishnu, have you heard about framework anytime in, in yes. the industry? Yeah, what's a framework? Uh, framework is basically like a guideline of how to do work. Yeah. Okay, so for example, uh, let us say you are um, doing a lead. Maybe skeleton, something like that, yeah. Okay. Or let us say, have you heard about A3? A3, no. A3 okay. implementations under Lean. It's a framework. Okay. Let us say you have a service and you want to improvise your service. So what do we have? We have current scenario. Let us say, what is your uh, service's current scenario? What is the problem you are facing there? How you intend to solve it? And what is your timeline to solve it? Let us say there is one framework available to us. What do you need to do when I give this framework to you? All you have to do is you have to put in your data. That's it. Yeah. Correct. Something like this, you can imagine that there is a, a neural network which has its own corpus, which was trained long back, which was approved by a lot of data scientists long back, which kind of is similar to what you are doing. Let us say the corpus over here was a lot of image or object identification. Any yeah. kind of object could be identified. Now we already have this neural network ready. So what these people have done is they have actually frozen their weights for us and converted them into an HDF format. Okay. Now what do I do? I take these weights as our framework. And now I just put in my data onto that. That's it. Okay. And use them. That's it. So I'll give you some of the popular ones which I am comfortable using is VGG net, mobile net. So what is mobile net? You use it every day on your phone. If you people observe, your phone tags your face. It is not possible to put a very heavy stuff on your phone because of computation. So we have simplified, we have simplified VGG into a very lightweight model called mobile net. And we are using this ready made. You can use uh, image net. You can use rest net. RES net. We will see down the line what are these things. But in the next videos, you are going to see this. Okay. Good. So the video next week should be very simple. So once you have got the concept of filters and convolutions, next week should not be a tough one. All right. 
week one i feel is the toughest and week week 5 6 i feel is the toughest so middle of these weeks are pretty easy we should not be okay all right guys so i think i'm done if you have any questions do let me know else let's close down question on the project because i think i when i was looking at the mm -hmm. data there were some missing values so for neural networks do we need to do any imputation no 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 missing values in what uh, images i think uh, there was some data also that was provided in one of the case studies i guess okay and it had many n values i'm not sure if it was that project only or if it no 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 project. in this project there is no missing value and there is no imputation to be done okay, okay. yeah oh, good. okay before moving on i just wanted to ask you one simple thing let us say i have an image which which is uh, say uh, uh, 64 cross 64 okay and uh, over here i have a neural network say the neural network is having 512 inputs for example okay and uh, i will say again they have their own hidden layers and finally we are converging this uh, neural network to say one classifier over here or two classifiers we don't care so the pointer over here is we are supposed to input 512 inputs my current input is 64 cross 64 cross say it's a grayscale image so one can you guys help me to put how many convolutions i need and what will be the size of my filters max pooling and all that can we do this quickly so that i get to know that you people are in sync and we can go we can go further on to this so let's let's start putting the blocks over here one by one yeah okay. so let's put the first block so what i'll do is i will we will write the filter size over here um filter size and max pooling and finally we'll fill, we'll put here what is what is the total number of you know we have got over here yeah so let's start how to do this how to design this filter uh three cross three filters okay so we'll we'll start with three cross three okay and how many i need for example uh, uh, 64 mm So how do you decide on that? Okay. So yeah. So one hint from my side is this particular term we have no clue on to how many we need and all. So for now you keep it empty. It's okay. But at least let us say you have decided three cross three. So if I have three cross three here, what will be my output here? So what will be the output of my uh, what do you say filters over here? So it is sixty-four plus three minus one. Sure. Yeah. Okay. What is the formula? Width of the image minus width of the filter plus okay. twice of padding divided by stride plus one. This is the formula. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So now start putting it. So first of all, I will say okay, stride is one only. I am not changing my stride, and the padding I have not done. Zero padding. So what will be the size here? So sixty-four minus three plus one. Okay, sixty-four. Sixty-four minus three is sixty-one. Sixty-one. Sixty-one by one, so sixty-two. So I can say the output that I'm going to get will be sixty-two cross sixty-two. Now, if you look at this, and if you look at this, it does not make much sense to me. Why? Because we have not reduced much. So to reach to five one two. So five one two means when I multiply these two, I should get five one two somehow. So if you multiply sixty four and sixty four, you are going to get four zero nine six. Yeah. So this particular thing is not going to help us. So in that case, what do I say is this transformation is not that great. Now to reduce it, what I will do is either I'll increase the size of my filter. It's not fair. Or else I will increase my stride. So let us say I increase my stride to four. Okay. Now can somebody tell me? So it's an odd number. Hmm. So odd divided by four is point values. Sixty-four minus three, or is let's 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 be fair, okay? Sixty-four minus two, two cross two will do. No problem. 
So 64 minus 2, that is 62. 62 by 4, that will be 31 by 2, that is 15.5. So say uh, 15 will take. So 15 plus 1, 16 cross 16 we can get. So that is a good transformation. So now what is the problem here, guys, is this is not an easy task to do. So on purpose, I took these numbers so that it is not an easy task that, okay, I have these things in my mind. I have some input. Let's try to convert the input to something. And also it is not easy to decide how much is the size of the filter, what will be my padding, what is this. So it is good to know the formulas and do convolution onto simple images. But when you go on to larger images, say one megapixel image, for example, and if I ask you guys that, okay, my, my image is one megapixel, can you design a CNN for me, which, which should intake 512 over here? So it'll be, you can do it, not a problem. You will, you will be able to put one by one all the filters or else even you'll back propagate and try to change and all. Good thing, nothing wrong, but it'll take a lot of time. So to avoid these confusions, what we do is we use a concept of machine learning. Oh, sorry, <laughs> concept of transferred learning, I'm sorry. Now what we do in transferred learning is, let's try to see that. Can any of you name one library from machine learning, which is the best, like which, which has almost all the algorithms or all the functions that we dropped? Like I'll, I'll give you an example of SVC or KNN or decision tree or random forest. Which library we used for? Scikit-learn. Scikit-learn, right? Let us say we use that library to do that. Now, what is exactly Scikit-learn? Can't we program a SVC using for and if loops? We can easily do that, right? But why don't we do it? Why? Because we already have a function. Somebody has returned it. Somebody has coded it in a generic way such that it will help us to input our unique data. And according to that, we'll get a customized output. It is solving my purpose. So what we do, we call this. Now, when we call this particular thing, what are we doing? We are getting the stuff ready-made from them. We are getting the hardware ready from them. The only thing is, I'm sorry, we are getting the infrastructure ready from them. Only thing what we are doing is we are putting our data. That's it. Now keep this in mind. Let us say there are certain readily available convolution networks. I'll show you down the line, which all are there. But say there is one convolution network, which is readily available. And say you have stored the weights of these functions you in an HF, H5 file or HDF file or whatever file we can. We have pickled all of these weights. I'm not saying the entire network. I'm just saying the weights of the network. Weights in the sense, what is the size of the filter and what is all, whatever we saw in the above example, which we kind of did not, if we're not able to clarify, weights are there. Now, what do I do? I ask or I request this particular model to import the weights to my model. So let us say this is your model. You have created an exact replica of this model. Now what you do is directly pick up the weights and drop it in your infrastructure. Okay. Once you drop it in the infrastructure, what is remaining now? So you have just got convolution weights. What do you have to do now? You just have to build your FCNN here. That's it. Fully connected neural network. This is, we can easily do it. Not a big deal. So this is what we do on the industry side. We do not write much of the CNNs. And even if we are successfully able to put a CNN of our own, Training it and correcting it will take a lot of time, to be very frank. So I will say majority of your uh, implementations on the industry point of view, you will be using transferred learning. But in, uh, in, in, in this certification, at least for one or two, or I think three weeks, we will be handwriting some of the CNNs. And after that, we'll start picking up CNNs of our choice as this. Okay, and uh, uh, that example that we saw, we will see it in the code. Let's see how we can solve it up. Okay, any questions on transferred learning? The concept part of it, I will show you how we do it. But this is what overall goes around. We directly take the weights and use it. Okay, any questions? No? no Perfect. No. All right, good. So now let's try to uh, use a PPT tool. So today I will use one PPT where they have mentioned a lot of networks. Now for first point, it will be very confusing immediately. So don't expect before, I don't expect you guys to master this uh, networks in one module itself. 
what we are going to do is i will pick up each network every week so let us say in today's uh, session i will pick up vgg which is the most important one probably next session i could show you something on lx something on elinet or i can give you something to do on le and post that we can go to the complex networks like restnets google uh, imagenet and all those things okay and this is not it there are so many available okay so let's start <laughs> yeah so for today's agenda we will start with cnn architectures so we just took an introduction of what is cnn uh, cpu versus gpu we know this i'll not go in much detail and the most important transferred learning now coming to the architecture of cnn try to push our uh, formula here whatever we saw right so harish i think this will solve our problem except i will say it will not the solve the problem of how many what is the math behind selecting the number of filters i'm still working on this guys and give me a week's time i'll try to find out <laughs> some paper or some logic behind this to oh, okay, krishna yeah yeah okay krishna okay, even so, i will uh, search for that yes and also i will request our great mm -hmm. learning uh, i think the professor who is mm -hmm. teaching this if he can share some papers with us so frank so far i'm not able to find any uh, particular good reference where i can say that this is the math behind selecting these filters maybe what i feel is as you said uh, they have they have also decided first what is the final final con uh, fully connected layer and then uh, they decided on this number six they were engineered it right yeah maybe right. maybe, maybe uh, i also think that uh, but right. i'm not sure yeah but still there should be some logic because randomly i cannot put anything here yeah yeah i feel it, it, it is a little weird <laughs> okay <clears throat> also yes. i tried uh, see if, if you see here what does it mean is we have 28 cross 28 six filters so what if i multiply 28 into 28 okay so let us say i have 32 into 32 now when you multiply 28 into 28 and then add it five or six number of times i'm not sure we are going to get the same number back to be very frank so what is happening is, as per our analysis or as per our knowledge in CNN, what is happening is we are converting, say, if the stride is one, then definitely you are going to have the network which look like this. So one particular image is getting converted into many features. That's what the six thing shows. So I used to take it as feature maps. I used to say there are six feature maps available. That means I can pick any one of them put it to one of my convolution network, sorry, fully connected networks and try to find some information out of this if possible. Okay, this is what I used to take, but now I feel that is not enough. I need also to know how to do this. So apart from this in today's session, let's ignore this. But apart from that, you can directly see 35 minus five, that is 27. We are saying stride as one. So divided by one, padding is done zero plus one. So if you look at it, 28 is the one. If we still do it, 28 minus uh, two divided by two plus one, you are going to get 14 out of it. Yes, yes. Formula holds pretty good onto this part of it. So at least 50% of the stuff is solved. Except now if you ask me, okay, how they came up with this network now. So I will say it is a lot of mix and match trials happening. So it's not a one shot job that, okay, they decided this and they got the best accuracy. Because if you look at it, they are currently working on 60,000 parameters. Okay. Now, what are these networks and how we can use it? So if you look at the highlighted area that I am just drawing, this is what I am interested in. So if I have a ready-made network, open source network for all of us, which can identify handwritten digits. So your neural network project, if you remember, seven, six, five and all. I know they were not handwritten, but anyway, we can correlate this. If I can do this, what I can do is rather than writing KNN, rather than writing the neural network, what I will do, I will ask uh, this LENET weights to be dropped onto my network and then design my own fully connected neural network, depending on how many number of outputs I have and take it forward. Okay, so these are the features. Now, if you, if you expect to use the readings onto a face recognition system, then it will not work to be very sure. Why? Because please remember, this is what is important. So why am I specifying is tomorrow when you're picking up this, you should know what it will solve. Okay. 
<clears throat> All right. So this is it. This only works for the handwritten digits. Nothing if, else we can apply. Yeah. If you are importing the weights, okay. If you are replicating this network and giving face as an input and trying to get an output and just check how it is. If you get a good output, then you can say that yes, it works for face recognition also. Got it. But for importing weights, it works only for hundred because they are trained only on that data. Okay. So yeah. it means like we, if you are using it ready made, then we can uh, apply it only for the handwritten digits. But if you are trying to replicate the same thing, same architecture, then we can uh, provide the face as whatever inputs we, we, we can. Perfect. Correct? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So when I deliver today's code to you guys, no? so in today's code, we are going to use VGG. We are going to import VGG and do it. So what you guys can do is, you can, you have the network in front of you. You pick up your older data, that MNIST or SVHN data from your previous project. You pick it up, try to replicate this network and see what you are getting as an output. Simple. Okay. So how do you replicate? You use the same uh, values. And at the end, when you're convert, connecting this fully connected neural network, you multiply these three. That's it. That will be your input. As simple as that. Or else, if you don't want to multiply all three of them, five into five, 25, and you give 25 as your uh, batch size. Okay. So at one shot, 25 will be picked up, put it in and moved up. Or else if you want all of them, all the filters to be put in at one shot, you can do that way. Or else you can pick up one by one. And do it. Yeah. So try this out. Good. It's good if you play around with uh, this particular network because it's a very basic one. So if you're good at this, then you will be good at the next one also. So uh, if you look at the features, it is for hand return. It was published in 1998. So I will say it is an outdated algorithm, but I have used this into multiple tasks where I have to identify simple digits. It works perfectly good. No problem at all. Yeah, 60,000 parameters. Uh, if you are looking at your current collab, then I will say it is not a very big network. If you're looking at Jupiter, yes, I will say it is a little heavy on Jupiter. The dimensions of the image decreases as the number of channels increases. So if you observe, the dimension is decreasing, but number of channels is increasing. Or else I will say rather than channels, what happens is when we say channel, we get confused with grayscale and RGB. Another case, I will say, call it as feature maps. So each square that you see five cross five square carries some kind of feature. That's what it means. The activation function used in the paper was sigmoid and tanh. But now what we do is you don't have to use always sigmoid and tanh. You can use relu now. You can replace both of them by relu. No problem. It will work good. All right. So this was your, uh, how do you say, this network. Okay. Now moving on. Uh, uh, okay. So some pointers here. It's a 10-way neural network classifier. It works properly on zero to nine data, handwritten digits, tolerant to various transformations like rotations and scale. So if you do augmentation also, it is going to work good. So our SVHN data will work pretty good onto this, no problem. Was used by banks to recognize handwritten numbers and digitize checks. So still uh, on a very basic level, yes, they do it. So what they do is if there is a check, let us say return, if there are certain numbers written on the check about what is the payment, then let us say there is a signature over there or something. In those cases, if you want to identify the digits or if you want to identify the check number or the date, you can easily put the check below the scanner you can pick up the data and process it. Very simple. You don't need a very heavy hardware for this also. And it's a four weights layer. So if you observe here, one, two, three, four, four weights. Okay. Now, if you guys have understood this, one quick question for all of you. Can somebody tell me if I put an Adam as in my optimizer, let us say A D A M Adam. Adam is going to work on this or on this. Take some time, think about it. how my back prop is going to work. Is it going to work on only fully connected or it's going to work on everything? I think for everything. Perfect. And what if Dhruv, I do, okay. So in, in the first case, if you are using the whole network as it is, yes, backprop is going to work for both of them. I'll show you how backprop works for this. You people know how backprop works here. Okay. Now, 
leading to this another question what if i import the weights to my network and i use my own fully connected neural net and go further so in that case backprop is going to work on both of them no no you got my question let me repeat myself what if you have you have uh, you have imported so this is my import of weights from the elinet website to my network and after that i am building my own fully connected neural network here something like this and now if i put adam adam is going to work on this or adam is also going to work on this also? Um, I think it will work for only for that part which we have customized, uh, not for the perfect. imported part. I perfect. feel so. Not sure. No, no. Perfect answer. Why? Because if I back propagate and if I change my weights, there is no fun of importing the weights. Why we imported the weights? Because they were standard weights. These were already learned weights. So if I back propagate here, it's not going to work out. So we have to make sure that if we do it, we freeze these pains. whatever we have before this we have to freeze them they are not editable and this side will be editable so i think in third or fourth week i will show you how to do that yeah but this is a very generic uh, uh, question so when you go for an interview or when you look at some of the most important deep learning convolution or cv questions this is what they ask uh, so this is one concept now keeping this in mind let's try to uh, complex or let's try to make one more uh, model out of this which will be your lxnet so lxnet is an extension of elinet i can we can say and uh, why do we need this is uh, let us say the earlier one was able to identify 0 to 9 what if i want to even if i want to identify some of the objects or some of the faces or any other thing which is not even number which is more than a number if i want to do that i need a bigger Our architecture. So what they have done is, they have simply increased the layers of convolution and pooling, convolution and pooling. That's it. Okay, there is no other difference. And if you observe, even their FCNN will differ because of number of changes. So the goal for the model was the ImageNet challenge, which classifies images into one thousand classes. For example, has sixty million parameters compared to. Sixty thousand parameters. So, when this increased, okay. So when this increased from sixty k to this one, even the capacity to classify images increased for us. Now it could be anything. If it comes under those hundred one thousand classes, you can use the weights ready made from this network to your network. <clears throat> it uses ReLU activation function default. and this paper was convinced the computer vision researchers that deep learning is so important fine this is blah 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 and this is how they have done this so if you want to see the tabular structure they have taken 1 2 3 4 uh four four heavy layers but if you look here one something is wrong in my diagram if you look here there are more convolutions Give me one minute. So we have one convolution. We have one. Um, uh, yeah, we have a convolution here. We have a convolution here. This is no convolution. No convolution. There is a convolution here, and there is a convolution here. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six convolutions, and two similar layers. Okay, there is no change over here. All right. So this is it. Okay. this is what is your lxnet it's an extension please remember this particular number it is very heavy okay. let's go to the extension of okay what made lxnet successful so i will say architecture i don't believe that because anything you mix and match definitely you are going to get something out of it uh we can say overlapping max pooling so if you observe here what is overlapping max pooling is if you observe we are not doing in middle we are doing for one we are doing for another one we are doing for another one okay this is what it means you don't have to do always max pooling after convolution uh relu function was universally used it is very simple 
uh, dropouts, cropping, data augmentation, and inference augmentation. So inference augmentation, I will say is, um, um, okay, let, let, let us today take the case study and revisit this uh, particular part. That more or less, if you look at the important part, this is what it solves. Uh, this is okay, it's not a big deal, not a big deal. Yeah, this is what you need to remember about max pooling, you don't have to do always. And I think architecture, fine. So these are some important uh, success factors of Alex. Okay. Next, coming on to VGG. Now, increase still more number of pooling and convolution layers, you will end up with this particular network. And uh, let's confirm what was the image size here, 227, 227, 3. And this was 9 to 6, 1. And here we have 224, 224, 3. And fully connected is 4096. Okay. So if you observe, again, what you do is you increase the number of convolution layers, modify LXNet to make something called VGG. 16 is not the latest version now. Now we are having 19. But both of them work equally. So for me, if I've done some implementation, if I'm using VGT 16, it gives me a good uh, accuracy. I don't go to 19. It's okay. 19 is a little heavier than 16. Yeah. <clears throat> Other all remains the same thing as our LX. No, no change out of this. So what are these algo? Uh, what are these networks? Is there were some challenges in which some of some of these people came together and built this up. That's all. If you ask me how, it's about mix and match. To be very frank. Yeah. Uh, Okay, this is of no use. Some of the important things is from 60 million, now we are jumping to 138 million parameters. Yes, it holds a total memory of 96 MB per image for only forward propagation. Most of the memory are in earlier layers. So if you just observe that uh, you have two things, one is your network and one is your FCNN. So we can say that most of the memory kind of goes away here this is the heavy part this is the lighter part okay uh, number of filters increased from 64 to 128 to 56 256 to 512 and 512 has been made twice so they are just replicating some numbers from the network so you don't have to remember all this whenever you want to use it just come back to this particular thing and try to replicate the network you have the numbers ready you just have to put it in the keras uh, add dense keras that's it whatever that, that particular command you have to use. And if anybody is interested in paper, this is the paper attached. I will say it's a little heavy. So first get comfortable with all this and then go on the paper and have a look at it. Okay. And as mentioned over here, there are two versions, 16 and 19, but more or less it does the same job. So whichever you want to use it up. Okay, good. Now comes a little problematic part. So now these were the three simple networks, which we can visualize. Now comes a little different network. We call it RESnet, ResNet. Now, my question to all of you is, uh, what if I want to use this particular hardware, whatever we have done? Okay, it's a very good network, agreed. But now I want to use on a handheld device and within fraction of second, if I give an image, no? within fraction of second, it should give me some output or it should, put a square around my face and say that, yes, we have identified it as you. Will your device be able to hold this up? Okay. You mean computer? Yeah, so if you have a mobile, for example. So will your mobile be able to hold this up? This, this, uh, this heavy processing? Maybe as you said, uh, there is another architecture called mobile net. Ha, mobile net. Oh, that's why you okay. Yeah, mobile net is an alternate version of it. Yes, but let's not go there. Let's try to think what if what we can do here. Or uh, okay, let me. My example is not correct. Then. Let me try to uh, create another example. So, guys, let's take one more example. Let's not think about computation side. Let's say I am currently having one image which needs to be given as an input and immediately within some time limit t i'm supposed to get the classification output along with some tagging or some some classified output now as you saw the number of layers are more over here so we had one layer another layer third layer fourth layer like that let us say so many layers are there and it is going in a sequential manner so far 
we have not broken any of the sequential uh, what do you say flow as of such correct now what if i want to increase the speed of this network what should i do as per you let us say i'll take five inputs from you guys the current time is t okay i want to make a time period saying that t new now t new should be far less than t that means it should be faster what should i do are you talking about embedding software like uh coral no. nvidia jetson and no no no, 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 no. let's not go there adruf let's say if i make some changes in my current network i should get some good speed i got it that this network is very good perfect we got that i don't want to lose it what if i am not happy with the time part of it so maybe to increase the hidden layers i mean it might uh, reduce the time if you increase the hidden layers then the time will increase right yeah right but but simplify the uh, input and output also exactly so how do we do that you are perfectly right how, how to simplify this now distribute okay okay so you kaushik you are talking about parallel processing something like that yes okay yeah. fine that could be a possibility so let me write down what if i have a parallel process or i am having a hadoop environment where i am doing parallel processing okay fine this could be one possibility but we are not changing the architecture right what we are doing is we are distributing the data i will split my data into many and then i will distribute parallelly onto multiple networks okay what can i do in my network okay let me give an example i think then you guys will be able to pull up something so guys let us say when this is my computer screen that you are able to see okay and uh, for example in front of my screen i show you half of the image like this okay now as soon as you see so just imagine that you are not able to see this particular part of it so as soon as you see this thing in my screen what do you assume it to be what shape you assume it to be everybody will say yeah it's a circle okay or else if i just so in the time frame if i am just scrolling one image onto my screen and you are able to see only half part of it but yet you are able to describe it right what it is you will have some assumption in your mind that yes he is trying to show a kind of square and as soon as it comes in the picture in my frame everybody knows yeah it's a square keeping this analogy in your in your concept what if i can give some early inputs say that i can take up the output of this and throw it to this so definitely it's going to go here so let us say the output from here to it goes here it takes some time frame t meanwhile parallelly i throw the output here also so what's going to happen this particular network is going to make some outputs and start throwing it in future so till our image is getting processed here our output would have reached here immediately so there are certain cases where if you look at certain parts of your image let us say in 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 this particular part this i'm sorry one of the feature map looks like this and as soon as i give this feature map let us say the feature map was here as soon as i give it to the next to next network and if it gives next to next to this network we could be able to identify that this looks like a cat possibly it's a cat so till i get all of my feature maps all of the shrinking and all i would have easily identified this are you able to get it kaushik this is something similar to what you said but here we are not splitting the data parallelly i am forwarding the data i am avoiding one of them and forwarding it further are you able to get it everyone amit dhruv shakti akash harish kaushik kranti raghu sort of yes yes logical yeah yeah uh, okay good so this is what restnet does now the only challenge so nobody challenge me here saying that okay fine if i do that let us say as i said there is one convolution layer max pooling layer convolution max pooling convolution layer. there are so many like this now what i do is 
by default there is a sequential order yes it will follow when it, it till it goes to a fully connected neural network but if i take an output from one node and give it to say this node don't you think the filter is going to mismatch agreed so let us say this is uh, 28 cross 28 cross 3 for example the output and when we reach here it could be 16 cross 16 cross 6 for example don't you think this is going to mismatch yes or no because in convolution every step we are reducing the size agreed so the output of uh, this particular one is going to mismatch with the next or next to next one so what we do to solve this is we keep the same stuff for all of them that means we design a network which has same filter sizes same activation functions all right this is how it looks like. It looks pathetic. So if you look at it, <laughs> it makes no sense as of such. But yeah, try to understand that we are giving an early output. We are skipping one uh, convolution and we are going further. All right. So it's a very, very deep network as suggested. Uh, and uh, uh, because of vanishing and exploding gradient problems. Now, what do you mean by vanishing and exploding gradient problems? So I will, I will show you down the line. So let us say, I ask you, guys, you have done the model, you have all of you have cleared the model on statistics. Yes. The first module. Yes. Can somebody name the three distribution uh, we have done in the statistical uh, module? Can somebody name this? Normal distribution. Okay. Poison distribution. Okay. And uh, there's a binomial distribution. Okay. Binomial distribution, yes. Okay, and one more. Okay, let me. I underestimated you guys. Yeah. Now. Now, five. Distribution, guys, for distribution. Oh, Bapre. Okay, good. Dhru <laughs> remembers everything. Okay, good. Okay, what if I say what were the statistical tests you people did? What are the statistical tests we know here? Two way. Uh, T test. T test. ANOVA. ANOVA. Perfect. Z test. Z -test. Goodness of fit. Sorry? Goodness of fit. Okay, fine. Okay, then you guys are ruining my example. <laughs> okay. See, what I was trying to show you guys was. Uh, okay, good, you people remember. Neither batch is said, we don't know. <laughs> so it helped me to explain my stuff. See, what happens is, guys, when you have a particular data which is passing through a multiple neural networks multiple neural networks you know now let us say the data is entered here it went through a lot of these convolution non-convolution layers whatever pooling layers whatever layers and finally it came here now say you found a loss here do l by do of weight one so let us say this is weights so what you do immediately you go here and change the weights it's still in the next propagation, if you are not happy, we immediately go back and change the weights. At least I can say that at least till here, if I change my weights, I'll be able to at least control them. So what do, I, what do I need to say is, the weights which are there in the earlier part of the network, if you have a very deep network like this, this particular weights are going to vanish away. More or the less, they will make not much significance to the network, to be very frank. This is called the problem of vanishing gradient. We are going to revisit this concept in NLP next module. Under NLP, we have a network called RNN, recurrent neural network. So there is a problem, same problem. RNN is a deep network where we will face the same issue. And to solve this, we use a network called LSTM. Long short term memory network. So we'll have some memory where we are going to store these weights down the line. Okay, now if you look at our ResNet model also, this is a very deep network. And whenever you find the word deep network, always say that or always remember that vanishing and exploding gradients are going to be a big issue. Vanishing gradient for these people, exploding gradient for these people. Their gradients are going to go pretty high because a lot of uh, changes will happen, which is very near to the output itself. Okay, so this is what is your ResNet. Next. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's all you need more or less 
Yeah, so this is what is the important points. So the architecture of ResNet 34, now you have many versions of this. This is ResNet 34, there is ResNet 150, I have seen ResNet 50 also. The concept is changed, only thing is, the number of layers that you are going to see here will be different, the deep layers, okay? All, th all are three cross three convolutions and same convolutions, no change. So we keep a uniformity. Uh, keep it simple in design of the network because we don't want to play around because I want my output to work on any of these convolutions. So I will keep it as simple as possible. Okay, and uh, if you observe, there are no fully connected layers. Okay, and I think that's it, that's all. And uh, one thing to remember is the dotted lines in this case, when the dimension, okay, one minute, where is my dotted line? Uh, concept okay so there are there are there are two things i'm not sure if you are able to see the dotted lines if your input and output are kind of tracing each other that means you can switch off some of these lines that these are optional connections that we have given it's not necessary to take each one of them and throw it so if you are designing it that you are surpassing only one neural network you can have some of them as dropouts saying that we don't need them basically so these are the dotted ones. So we will see, I will implement one of these rest nets. It's not in our course. It's not in our standard format here, but I don't want to leave this. I will implement this rest net and I will show you once you are comfortable with the first three algo uh, networks. Okay, so we'll do this. Let's see how we can design and take this. So first thing is we'll do design it. Second thing is we'll directly import the weights and use them. Perfect. So this is what is the expanded or zoomed version of ResNet 34. Yeah, 34 represents the total number of deep, uh, how deep the network is. Now, coming to how to decide how many layers to take and all this part of it. So very simple. If you have around five layers in your network, it's a very easy network. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a deep network at all. If you have around 10 layers, including initialization and batch normalization is included. I can say, yeah, it is still an easy one, but it's a little complex, a little deep as compared to five. If you go to 30 and 100, these are the real deep networks, especially I'll say that this one is a very deep network. And in this network, if you are using this, you have to identify how to skip the connections because the time is going to be very long. So if you are planning to have 100 layers or even 30 layers, please make sure that you have skipping the connections, the one which you did in ResNet. So more or less I can say these are the examples of ResNets, LSTMs and all this sort. Okay. And anything about thousand layers, I'm not sure. I've never seen in my life. What? We have no idea about it. How deep is going to be? So if you want to look at one of the layers, which is very deep, this could be an example of the inception network from Google. Okay, look at this and they have a lot of connections, a lot of skippage is happening here. <clears throat> so what is it? Uh, the inception network consists of concatenated blocks of inception modules. Okay, the name inception was taken from the meme image, blah, 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 we don't need this. Sometime a max pool block is used even before the inception module to reduce the dimension of the input. So please remember, it is not always necessary to take the image as it is. The way we used to do PCA, same thing we can do it here also. Now, have I shown you any times how to reduce the dimension in image processing? No. No? Have I shown you anything on auto encoders anytime? No, right? No. Right? I'll show you today. So no. if, if you remember, we used to do SVD, PCA and FA. And TSNE, I'm not sure even you have done that. Um, have you heard about TSNE guys? All right, I will show you one more dimensional reduction technique in machine learning today. But apart from that, if you want to do same thing in neural network, how should we do it? The first way was nothing but your convolution layer. Correct? Convolution was something like um, shrinking the data itself. But if, if you look at convolution as data reduction, there is a problem. Let's see how. Let us say this image you are having here, which is say 64 cross 64. And after convolution, before flattening, you got an image say which is uh, five cross five. Or you will, I will not say image, I got some data which is five cross five. What we have done, we, have sh we, are, we are able to shrink this up. 
okay now can i use this for future processing if i give it to one of our networks say elinet lxnet and all will will lx elinet be able to identify that this is a part of a larger image like this yes or no can i do something like this uh, which i call it dimensional reduction is it possible to think about yes we can do that we can do that okay we got one yes any anybody else thinks it's not a good idea or is a good idea it, it is possible yes okay fine so from my side you guys can try this out if you if you can do it if you put a fcnn at the end yes it is possible it because it will become your cnn again if you put an fcnn here but what if i want to send this to some other networks the other networks will not have the decodings here right you remember we have done some some encoding here we have used some filters to encode this data have we given them the decoder back it is like that cipher i am not uh, sure if you heard about this let us say you want to secretly communicate something so what you do is you implement your cipher there there will be a, a filter which you multiply with all the things and it will create some new numbers it will look like junk data now this cipher to decode this you have to give divide the whole data by the cipher again then you are going to get it back correct now this is what i call it as a cipher whatever we have done here are we providing cipher along with that so tomorrow if you want to recreate this image use the cipher we are not doing it right so what if i want to reduce the size of the image and if i want to recreate it we should be even able to replicate it back okay but in this case what i will do is if this was 64 plus 64 i cannot re replicate the whole thing back i cannot have the whole sampling done so what i will do it yes if i want to reduce the size to 50% i will say 32 cross 32 but still i will be let us say if the number 7 is here i will be able to vaguely represent 7 back this is called auto encoders i'll show you today one implementation also but on very high level this is how it looks like and if you ask me what is present inside these uh, networks there are two things which is present one is called encoding okay encode and one is decode okay now anybody here from electronics and communication background or communication background or at least especially dsp part of it anybody shakti your camera is on yeah <clears throat> anybody from this background or even from computer science background you, you guys would have done it uh, encoders decoders no cryptology or something like that Crypto i think i have yeah yeah, yeah. So you can correlate yeah, study correct you can correlate this concepts there saying that we will have something done on an image we'll shrink it and then later on we'll pass it we will again recreate it and pass it to our network now why do we do that very simple thing i have reduced my dimension i have retained the data all right now what are these encode and decode very simple it could be your fully connected neural network design a network whose outputs are little lesser as compared to your original input how many ever layers you want it to how will you design this layers depending on this so first of all you have to decide the decoding size how much you want to decode up to okay and then finally you design inverse neural networks keep training them unless and until you we are satisfied that both of them are almost similar this is called auto encoding it's not a very popular way to do it because definitely in future if if i have seven this image will not be 1 megapixel okay i want to take hd images and shrink it and if i take an hd image shrink like this definitely i'm going to lose some data out of it everybody agrees to that we cannot completely recreate this no matter how good our network is here okay so this is your neural network simple one this is also a neural network you train the weights back and forth till they both sync up all right so this is an auto encoder i'll show you one implementation down the line yeah so what i was asking here yeah so uh yeah so in other cases what google has done is they have done max pooling so also you can think about max pooling as a dimensionality reduction yeah so let us say if you have an image say 
my favorite number 32 cross 32 okay now if i want to create the if i want to replicate this image into 16 cross 16 what i'm going to do i'm going to max pull by 2 32 by 2 is 16 very simple you can do this or you can do the one which i showed you anything is okay okay so this is your google net uh, we will take this particular network at the end of the module so that you are very comfortable and you don't get confused because by looking at it itself it's pathetic it's horrible and to understand this i'm not sure even if this is open source i'm still seeing to it if we can download it else what i'll do is we'll do a very good uh, in-depth theoretical review onto this what is it and how they got hold on to this okay and what is the application of google net all right now if you compare the most popular ready-made uh, networks available you will find them over here if you look at this the most stable one is vgg so down the line i think almost all of my implementations you will find vgg itself it's very simple to work with vgg okay and look at the accuracy also vgg is not very great it co covers around 65 to 75 but yes from um, the parameters point of view it is showing one of the highest parameters available more the parameters better will be your learning okay lxnet and uh, google net lies somewhere here restnet is somewhere here uh, restnet 152 okay so 152 in the sense you are having more parameters that's it more number of d players as compared to 18 34 and 150 restnet 50 restnet 101 so different versions are there okay so this is how you can visualize this particular graph so i will i will say if you guys have decided to transition your career onto computer vision then you need to know some of the most popular ones like vggs uh, i will say lxnet base one and uh, cerisnet 152 so if you know these three algorithms you can say yes i know computer vision yeah, because they are the top performers, if you see, except LXNet. LXNet is the one uh, very basic one, but these two are kind of top performers here. And also try to correlate them with the number of features available. Okay, good. All right. Now coming to the concept of transfer learning. So too much of theory. We'll come down to this very simple diagram. I have got a source task let us say some tasks generic one. i am putting and i'm running a lot of hardware onto this and i'm putting it to my knowledge now what do i do is i've got my target task here yeah. let us say our real-time application which i want to use it on i get my data i import your learnings onto my learning system and i classify my stuff that's it so you don't have no more we have to do the classical traditional machine learning way of doing it in your model and then use your model no need to do that use ready-made learnings to move on so this is your transfer learning and if you look at the learning curve also to be very frank this is a better one obviously and majority of my implementations that i do i ready-made i take a ready-made network itself i don't take a pain of doing cnns uh now you may ask me okay fine then why are we learning it you will understand cnn's the use of it after week number four where we enter rcnn fast rcnn yolo ssd all the complex algorithms that we enter no? at that time again we'll we have to use cnn's we have to use some part of it so the concept of building cnn is important. okay great so i think we are done yeah too much of theory so what do we have today is we have got a very simple uh, data set where we have got data splitted already into test and train okay and what do we have inside both of them we have same five folders and each folder is having some flowers which belong to each one of them okay so this is what is the data our job here is to classify the flowers from the testing part of it so we we'll train it using our training data and we'll use this particular chunk to classify them as simple as that so the upper ones is the upper code is for the people who want to use collab so i'll start from here uh so this is my keras so now i think you guys are comfortable on the sequential part convolution 2d as soon as you say convolution 2d max pulling comes into it flattening it dense and drop out now i'm not sure with version 2.0 whether this is going to work good but i think from from here it is it, it looks like something like this from tensorflow dot 
get ours and then everything goes through. Okay, so you have to make some modifications. You might get some errors if you have latest version. Now moving on directly to the classifier. So if you look at this, I have got 32, three cross three, uh, what do you say, filters. And I've got an input shape of 64 cross 64 cross three. So very simple, padding is zero, stride is one. Just put the formula, 64 minus three, that is 61. 61 by um, striding, uh, stride is one as usual, plus one. That means uh, answer is going to be uh, 62, no. No, 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 no. One minute. Answer is going to be. Yeah, 62. 62 only, no? Then why my, it's not working? Because the next one, next one is 3 cross 332. Okay, so rather than taking this approach, what I will say is we'll take this particular approach. Say 64 into 64 is what? 4096. Okay, 4096, when you pass it through your uh, max pooling function of two cross two, what are we doing? Basically, we are dividing it by two. So when you divide 4096 by two, you are gonna get 1096. 1096, again, you max pool it, you are gonna get, uh, I'm sorry, not 1096, sorry. You are gonna get 20, how much? Can somebody help me here, I'll have to get my phone. Okay. Four zero nine six divided by two is two zero four eight. Perfect. Now two zero four eight. When you again divide it, max pool by two. Uh, divide this by two. You are going to get one zero two four, right? And one zero two four. When you again max pool it by two, uh, we are going to get five hundred. Perfect. So now, if you look at my activity, okay. There's a lot of noise. If you look at our uh, input for uh, fully connected neural network. Our neural network ends at 512 is flatter. Okay, so take this approach of solving this uh, problem. Yeah, so as per me, this I'm, I'm not changing the filter size, it's working good. Now, this is not an optimal solution. We'll, I'll create some problem statement and give it to you. You guys play around with the layers more and more, but make sure that at the end it should match with your input of your fully connected neural network as simple as that okay now if you look at it what we have on the first layer of we have 32 3 cross 3 this is my input standard stuff i'm using no changes here second one also standard third one standard same thing this is 512 and once you enter a fully connected neural network i'm saying give me some dropout uh, a dense layer could be so divide by four of this, for example, and activation function is ReLU. And finally, if you observe, I have got one, two, three, four, and five, five classes. So obviously my total number of outputs is five and my layer is soft. So now I think we are good at it, right? So this is a simple CNN that I have designed. Now moving on, I uh, wanted to show you something a little bit more here, wherein we are calling our Adam okay and we are putting into our compiler but apart from our learning rate if you remember we have not used these functions so far now what are these how do you check this so one way to go and check all of the activation thing is you can go to keras documentation and uh, go to optimizers you will get list of all the optimizers available which is sgd rms prop ada grad grad ams grad ada delta adam Adam is the most common one and SGD is also the most common one. And if you have a deep network, you can use an RMS propagation, RMS prop. Yeah, so I'll show you down the line how you can use this also. Now, uh, what are these extra terms? So these all hyperparameters are defined there anyway. So the first thing is your DK factors. Now, everybody gets what is a DK, what DK I'm talking about. If you remember the Gradient descent that we have, you know, is kind of decays down. You know, so the standard values, if you don't even initialize them, the standard values are going to be this only. So I'm not playing around with this anymore. I'm just trying to show you that tomorrow, if you will increase your learning rate, your decay is going to be more steeper. 
So if you look at it, beta 2 and decay rate, if you add them up, you are going to get standard answer is 1. So please keep a good check on both of them if you are playing around with more with learning rate. And also if you observe, there is something called beta 1 and beta 2. Both of them represent decay rate. So this could be the decay rate for the first estimate. First estimate, let us say it could be um, the first DOE function that you do from your backprop. And this could be the estimate, uh, the one from the second estimate, the second one. Yeah, usually we don't play around with this. Even on web, you will not find many implementations who have done this, but just wanted to give you some uh, hyperparameters here. And the last one is epsilon. It makes sure that we don't misclassify anything or we don't basically go into infinity state. So in none of our implementations, we are doing any operations with zeros. If you observe that, we are not adding or multiplying or dividing any of the zero part of it. Some of the neural networks or a machine learning part of it, Keras, we do some manipulation zero. So in this case, it will make sure that we don't do it. So by default, we keep it off. Okay, we are not worried about this. So these are some of the hyperparameters. And as usual, we are using categorical cross entropy because I've got five outputs and my matrix is nothing but vectors. right? Next thing, we have not done any data manipulation. That means we have not cleaned our data. So now what I'm doing is, I'm augmenting my data. Now, if you don't want to write a separate function for augmentation, and if you want to do it as per stuff, what you do is you import image data generator. This is the function. So it will give you a lot of parameters. Some of the important ones are these, wherein rescaling the image, you are uh, having the rotating the image, you are zooming the image, you are flop, uh, flipping horizontal flip, vertical flip, all those things. Yeah. So this is the way you can create some kind of augmented images if you are not happy with size of data. Same thing you can do it with your test data also. Okay. Next thing you call your test data from the directory and you say clip it to this size. Select one size. Why 64, 64? Because you have designed a CNN which inputs 64, 64. Three. Three is the number of channels. Okay. So match it up. Next, total number of images you want to be you want to pick up in one run. So it depends on your computer. If you have a high-end RAM for it, I will say increase the size of this. Now, can somebody tell me why do I need to focus on increasing my batch size? What difference is going to make even if I specify this or if I don't specify this? What is your understanding of batch size? What do you mean by batch size? How much data it process per epoch? Correct. So uh, why should we take 32 here? Why can't I take a more number? Correct. So please remember, if you want to increase speed up total number of, so if you say 20 epochs, and in each epoch, say you are picking up around, uh, you are, you are, your computer is keeping ready 32 images to be processed. What if I give more flexibility to my computer and say I will double it up? Just observe by changing the size of batch, just observe your epochs. The total time taken by 20 epochs to run with 32 and the total time taken by 64. And let me know what did you observe. It might slow down. Kind of, yes. Okay. So again, it is very important basically to select this. So what I usually do is I divide this number by two. I know logically it's not correct. I divide this by two and keep some familiar number here. That's it. Okay. So there is no logic onto that, but yes, high end computers can do it. My computer will crash if I take 64 or 128 here. Now moving on, same thing for your test. I'm taking the same part of it. And finally you are fitting your data using the generator one so that we can get good augmented images and say this is my training set this is my validation uh, validation data and in your epochs say i want to run 20 epochs you are seeing something new here today which is called steps per epochs now what do you mean by that in one epoch i want that particular epoch to run these many number of times so what is 3823 3823 is the total number of training images we have divided by how many of them are picked up at a time 32 from where from here so i'm saying is even if it is not an integer convert it to an integer and each epoch inside each epoch you give me that many number of steps 
So either you can have more number of epochs or you can have internal steps within epochs, whatever suits you. I gave you both the options. So far you would have seen only this, right? Okay, so this is what you can do it. I say this is a better option so that we get to know that if in case one epoch we are running 119 times again and again, probably I'll say within four to five epochs we'll be able to get better accuracy. So if you observe here, the amount of accuracy, amount of accuracy change is pretty high. So this thing is turning pretty good rather than having 40, 50, 100 epochs. You have to wait a longer time for that. Even this will be longer because we are inside each epoch and having these many steps. So definitely it's going to take longer, but the accuracy part of it will be pretty good. So if you scroll down the line, I ended up at 20 epochs. So after certain epochs, you observe it is not going further. The accuracy is going kind of going down. Now there could be multiple reasons for that. The first reason could be the way we have chosen the steps, but this is the only way to do it. Second could be we have done too much of augmentation might be so that we are not able to find some pattern. Third one could be our learning rate and uh, optimizer. And the most important reason could be the CNN layers that we have made. Okay, so I chose totally to make four layers. Why? Because our Elinet had that option. So I did that. But what if I don't want this? I want to increase my accuracy here. So I give it to you guys by next Friday or Saturday maximum. Send me your uh, inputs, how you can improve this. All right. Okay. You don't need to do this on the industry side because we have got ready-made networks. But anyway, if you play around with these numbers and also check the blog that Drew has given, it will help you guys to formulate it. Delete one layer, add one layer, or I have taken a max pool size of two cross two. You can take four cross four also, no problem. Three cross three also, no problem. And I have taken standard filters here. You play around with the filters and see how it happens. But the only issue is don't run 20 epochs you are going to waste your time looking at your monitor. So try to run less number of epochs and see how much accuracy is increasing down the line. Okay, so here we have got around 80, losses 49 and validation losses 90 and validation accuracy 64. So I will still say it's not a very good model because it's an underfit model. Okay, good. So this is one implementation on CNN. Now, what if we, uh, yeah, so now a little uh, different way of coding this. So giving you guys a hint of how you can save your model. So first of all, what you guys do is every time you kill your kernel, you come back, you have to rerun the model. If you don't want to do it, use this two options, wherein you have an option to save your weights, whatever weights you have, so that you can import it in the next network whenever you need it, or you can save your whole network as it is. So this is one way to do it. Another way is to do called, uh, uh, what is called joblib. So there is a library called joblib, which does it. Or there is something called pickling. If you want to see all these three today, I will show you down the line. If you are happy with this, usually in CVs, computer visions, we do this one. We don't do joblib and pickling. For machine learning, I can say these two are good. Okay, by in machine learning, we don't have weights to be stored, but here we have an option either you store the classifier itself or the weights, any of this. So now what I've done is I've pickled them so that I don't have to rerun every time I open my code. Down the line, what I'm doing, I'm calling back my model, calling back my weights, both of them together. All right, now once I do that, what am I doing is I'm reading some random flower or set of flowers. Okay, and uh, next I'm changing the dimensions. Basically, I'm reshaping them. I'm changing the dimension. I'm changing the values of it by normalizing it. Finally, I'm uh, saying uh, this is the name of the flower that I'm going to pick it up. Okay, the di sorry, the dimension of the uh, image that I'm going to pick it up. And finally, I run my classifier. I predict that particular image onto this. Yeah. So if you look at the output, this is the size of my image. This is the uh, image after expansion. Yeah. Uh, next, this is the set of options that we have. And out of these options, if you look at the softmax output we have got, can somebody hint out if this is my softmax output, which one of this is the classified answer? Sorry? Daisy. Daisy, exactly. Right? Look at the probability. Softmax is nothing but probability. The one with the highest probability 
will be the answer. So in this case, we have identified <laughs> anyway, it's this slide <laughs> here, but yes, please look at this stuff. So this is not needed, but anyway, we got the answer directly. So now whatever image we gave was a daisy. Now, what if I want to run it across the whole testing data and generate the matrix? So very simple. I'm just getting all of my test data from the path, putting the hyperparameters and running the model onto that. When I do that, I get a, a confusion matrix like this. And if you look at this, these are our flowers that we are talking about. And if you don't want to do that, there is precision, recall, F1 and support for us. Now, what is precision we know, recall we know. What is F1? F1 is a balance between both of them. Okay, I kind of, kind of say average between both of them. And what is support? Support will say how many images of this class are present in the whole data set, the frequency of it. So it's something like our target, uh, you know, we used to do dot value counts, if you remember, to check the target, same thing like that. In this case, good representation. But if you observe the precision recall, they are not that great. So the one which classifies, gets classified the best is this one, sunflower. All right, so this is a very simple identifier. I have a question, how do we read that matrix that is shown above the... Yes. Above the... yes. So in this case, how you can read that? 67 of daisies have been identified properly, okay? Now, out of that, 12 of them, which are actually daisies, are identified as the next one, dandelion. 13 of them are identified as rose. Three of them as sunflower and five of them as tulip. Okay. So find out, if you, if you want insights out of this, you can find out the flowers which are very close to each other. So in this case, you can say that uh, uh, daisy and rose. We can say our daisy, rose and uh, dandelion. They look almost similar. Why? Because the misclassification is maximum here. Or else if you look at the last three of them, which is uh, rose, sunflower and tulip, the misclassification is happening too much. So tulip by mistake is getting classified majorly as tulip and rose are getting confused. Okay, so this is how you can read it. Good. And if you want to look at the correct classifiers, look at the diagonal elements. They are the correct values of your classification. All right. Amit, okay. Yeah, thanks Krishna. Perfect. Good. So this is one simple CNN example that you can see. Let's try to, so this is one way you can do transferred learning, one way I showed you, but that learning was not from any of the normal uh, better networks, it was our own network. Now let's do, let's try to see one more data set where we can do. Sir, I have a question on last. Yeah. Why yeah. we used padding as same? We are not doing padding. That, that's what we mean by that. Okay. Padding is zero. Okay, okay. Okay. So what I did was I, I kept it very standard. So I want you guys to basically uh, do all the mix match possible and try to create your own network. All right, good. Uh, after that, right yeah. now in the case study that we just saw, it was mm -hmm. a continuing right where we were loading the model that we created at the upper part. Mm -hmm. So does that mean the kernel is uh, restarting when we are loading the model again? Yeah, the kernel is anyway. It's the same workbook because. No, see, uh, what you can do is when. There is a lot of noise. I mean, one, I just okay. So now you, you mean to say is that when I switch off my kernel and when I restart, will I be able to get the same model back? That's, that's what you're trying to ask me, right? Do I have to re-import the entire program or it's just from the load model part? Just load model part. That's it. That's it. But if you are loading your weights onto your new model, wherever you are loading, we have to make sure that the weights that we had over here, no, the, the, the infrastructure that we created here should be same as this. So if your new, say new network should look something like this, it should have at least these many layers to put the weights onto. Got it? So it is like your machine learning part. Let us say 
you trained your machine learned model onto four variables now when your model is ready when you are predicting it if you are predicting on three variables what's going to happen it's going to crash why because it was not one more variable is missing so you should match this up that's it but yes you are perfectly right you can do it on any of the other codes not only on this code you can import it somewhere else also all right yeah. only thing we have to make sure is we have to get the good correct path of the file or else what i usually do is i put it in a local directory itself wherever i'm using the code so that i don't have to take a deck of copy yes, so right now in this example we saw there are images in the folder hmm yeah but uh, in the case study or in the project that we have we have a h5 file hmm. which i think is a conversion of images into some hmm. different right hmm hmm so i just wanted to understand uh, why here we are because we are also saving here in h5 part but mm -hmm. uh, is it uh, that we will get uh, the in, uh, what do you say the coded part h5 file sometimes and sometimes images and based on that we have to take it into account because the way this was uh, this data set was loaded is something uh, in a different way compared to how we load it but Okay, so I think you were not there in my session when I explained the HDF format, right? You, I think this is your second session or third session, no? It's Amit? my second. Second, okay. So you were not there when I explained HDF basically. What is this HDF format? HDF format is a is a zipped file, you can say, okay, which will consist of lot of matrices, okay. now each matrix represents an image over here okay and each image has a target variable attached to it so in your previous project if you remember the target column was what what number it is and the 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 the, the sampled part of image was stored as a uh, matrix this is what is hdf format now in our case what we are doing is when we are storing it as an h5 format or any other format what happens is it it tells me or it gives me some kind of mapping that this is say layer number 1 and these are the weights of layer number 1 this is layer number 2 and these are the weights of layer number 2 so whenever i import this okay python interprets this and directly starts loading these weights in our current infrastructure got it amit if you want to see in detail give me some time i will make one specific case study on how to what are the different varieties in which we can import and map the data if you want to do that you can do that also we have zip format we have tar format we have got hdf format we have got hdf4 format we have got h5 format um then we have got a uh, jpeg and png format also multiple ways we can do it. we down the line in one of the case studies even what we have done is we have done embedding that means we have directly imported the image and tagged it ourselves that's our own format if you guys want to see one specific case studies on all the imports we can do that also no problem let me know okay yeah sure that will be great perfect all right so can we move on amit is it is it good now you are clear about it yeah All right. Hey, hey, one more. I did not ask any of you. Uh, project is submitted, right? By all of you. I think even the score is out. Anybody wants to discuss the project solution? Do let me know. We'll do it. Okay. The previous project. Let me know. <clears throat> I'll dump the solution anyway. But I'm not sure whether I've discussed the solution with you guys or not. Please remind me. Okay. I might forget sometimes. Now, coming to. Okay. We'll do this auto encoder last. now coming to this particular data set uh we'll do one thing we don't have enough time to go through the whole data set so we will we will revisit the, it's a huge uh, basically huge uh, case study so for now what i will show you guys is i will show you how to import the uh, findings and how to load it on the uh, network okay so just uh, uh, think about it that there is a data set that i have which has different breeds of dogs okay and they have the photographs and uh, embeddings inside of these breeds the same way we had flowers now we have got different breeds i think we have around uh, 19 or 20 odd unique breeds available here 
Now, what are we doing is we are building our own convolution neural network as usual, my normal pattern of building it. So I'm starting with some numbers, say 32 phi cross phi. Okay. And my input size is exactly same as the size of my images, which is 128 cross 128 cross three. All right. Next, say I'm having a filter size of 64 cross 64. Uh, sorry, total number of 64 filters, four cross four each kernel size. Yeah, and I'm keeping the standard functions the same. So I've got one, two, three, four layers. And after that, I'm building my dense layer. Very simple. And the total number of unique outputs we have is 120. I'm sorry, I said 90, but it's total unique breeds are 120. All right. So this is this is one example of a CNN that we are building. Now, when I run my CNN down the line, uh, let me show you. So when we run the CNN, yeah, so when I run my CNN, say for example, uh, for number of some number of epochs, say for one epoch, and each epoch I have taken a step of 8177. That means I'm running 8177 epochs as of such. When I do that, look at my validation accuracy and normal accuracy. I'm getting 0 0.08, that is 0.8% of accuracy, and validation is 0 0.01, that is 1.1% 1 .1 of accuracy. Underfit model, definitely. Yeah. Why we got this? Because of whatever stunt we did over here by creating our own CNN. All right. Now, what if we are stuck in this situation? We don't have time to play around with multiple stuff over here. So in that case, what we can do is we have got standard VGG 16 weights. The only thing is there is a file which we have to store it. Either you can download it. Yeah. From here, you can give the reference over here or I can put it in my local directory and give a reference like this, whatever you wish. Yeah. So I'm saying this is my new base model. This is my new model that I call base. And these are nothing but VGG 16 weights. And here you define the location of your H5 file from where you are getting them. So if you observe the format of this file, and if you observe the format of our, this file, they're exactly same. So basically this format is used to store this up. Next thing, what I get is I, uh, what do you say, uh, reinitialize, like put my X and Y again. So basically I reinitialize my target column and um, uh, training column. Now in this, only one thing I wanted to show you guys something new was TQDM. Now TQDM is a method of generating this uh, status bar if you observe. What is the current status of it? If you want, to, because sometimes when the epochs are running, we are not sure how much time it will take. And all. So definitely we have a timer here, but yes, if you want the whole stack, TQDM will help you to do that. All right. Now, next thing is what are we doing is we are getting all the images one by one. And once we get the images, we are passing the images through our base model. What is a base model? Base model is a model that we have defined by building our VGG. So I am, I am indirectly telling them, I don't want to, take this through my neural network, my FCNN or my normal network where I am doing forward and backward. For now, you pass on my inputs through my new weights, as simple as that, all right? And once we do that, we are building our fully connected neural network, the backend part of it, the final part of it. And then I'm compiling it and finally we are running it. Did you get it, how I froze the layers? Because if you remember, we are not supposed to back propagate this. So if I would have put the weights here along with our model.fit, what's going to happen? It's going to do back propagation and change all of our weights. I don't want to do that. So first itself, I'm running my inputs through our weights. I'm multiplying them. So it is nothing but your input is there. This is your input and these are your weights. You're directly multiplying it and making it as one particular matrix. Now you use this as your X train, basically onto your final model. Got it? And when you run the model, if you observe the last accuracy we got is around 98.39%. So it's a better model than the one above. Are we clear? Guys, any confusion onto this? The freezing part of it and non physical part of it? Oh, freezing is uh, uh, multiplying our current input with weights. Uh, weights. Yeah. Exactly. So what I'm doing is in hurry, I'm having my images or my X training data. I'm saying it, whatever weights I've got, no, multiply with the inputs. 
and make it a bigger matrix. And now use this as your training data with your FCNN to do front and back propagation. Now, even if back propagation happens, do you think it will change anything for training data? Nothing. It will change everything on your FCNN only. Because it will not get it that this is a neural network. And what are weights? Weights are nothing but some kind of matrix. Very simple. All right. It'll take some time. <laughs> so uh, it'll take a week's time for you guys to get normal to this way of coding it. Yeah. So give some time. Try exploring this. So now I will deliver both the codes to you. What you people do is in this particular, the earlier code that I've shown you, you know, instead of using my model, you use this VGG 16 model and see if you are able to improvise. Okay. And this from here down the line, it's a universal code. It will work for anywhere. No problem at all. Good. Everyone clear? Let me go through. Harish, Akash, Avmeet, Dhruv, Kaushik, Kranti, Raghu, Saurav, Shakti. Are we all clear on this? Yes. Yeah? Krishna, yes, on, yes. on this one, you have imported uh, OpenCV. Yeah. So, yeah, that will come to it. So, the, the way we are getting the images will come to that. We, that's what I'm saying. We'll do this. We'll redo this case study in detail. Okay. okay. So it's supposed to be a, a mix between week three and uh, week two and week three. Actually, it'll be very heavy if I go through it right away. <laughs> okay. okay. Sure. So we'll redo this, but I just wanted to give you the idea of transferred learning. This is how we do transferred learning majorly. I don't waste my time doing this. I'll directly pull out the data. Right. The okay. only drawback of transferred learning is. First thing is you have you have to I will say completely depend on their weights tomorrow if they remove the stuff from online or their support we are helpless the model will go down and second issue is that if the weight is not trained on that particular set of images let us say you want to build a neural network on space images now we should have some network pre-trained on that right if it is not trained on that then we'll not be able to use it that's only two issues otherwise everything works good. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so these are the two. We'll redo this. I will, we will go through again. And if possible, I will, we'll do live coding so that we get hands on to the complete coding part. Yeah, and also I want to give you the complete flow. So what is the standard flow of a uh, CNN? Okay, what do we do? What should we do and all this part? Okay, so this is one thing. Now let's come to something onto auto encoding. So if you remember that uh, dimensional reduction technique that I was talking about, a very simple code where we have the same MNIST data, handwritten data, and this is the original image, and this is the undersampled image, or I will say the dimensionally reduced image. Good. How do we do that? <clears throat> get the libraries, get the data reshape the data, normalize the data. Decide that from this level of input, how much you want to come down to. So say I want to come down to 64. Depends on you how much you want to reduce the dimension to. Okay, so once I come down to that, you do all the resizing or reshaping thing on the image part of it. Next, we have to call our uh, model. So if you observe here, what do we have? We have got an input. So I just explained to you guys what is on the auto encoder. This is your real input. Then you will have some encoding part of it. And then you will have some decoding. This is encoding, this is decoding, and this is your output. Okay. So this is my input. This is my encoding layers. This is my decoding layers. And this is my auto encoder layer. So if you observe here, I have, I'm not writing multiple layers. I'm just writing normal dense layers here. And other things I think are self-explanatory to you guys. All right, so this is another alternate way of creating a Keras uh, lens model. Four lines, enough. After that, what are we doing is we are calling our back prop and fitting the model. Now, while fitting the model, what are we doing? We are increasing the batch size. We are having some epochs. We are saying shuffle is equal to do. Shuffle in the sense, if we, if we want, you can do some augmentation part of it. And test and train split we are doing here. We are saying 80-20 split, basically, okay? So validation is nothing but our testing data. So when I run it through, and if you look at the accuracy part, I get around, uh, uh, okay, there is no accuracy here. I'm really sorry because I did not 
we did not put the metric over here as accuracy. I just wanted to see the loss part, how much loss we are having. And if you observe it, the loss percentage is not that great between both of them. All right. Now, how we see this image, how do we observe whatever we have done is good or bad. So in that case, we'll call the uh, autoencoder dot predict onto our testing data. And then finally, we'll plot the original data versus the testing data. So the only uh, show stopper here is I am dot show. That's it. You are supposed to know this. Okay. How a matrix gets converted to an image. I am dot show as simple as that. And what shape and size you want, even you can specify. So here I've got 28 cross 28. This is the original image. This is the dimensionally reduced image. Now, if we are not happy with this, so let us say if you are making a implementation where uh, when a, a security guard, let us say, runs uh, the, the device through some of the cars, they will get the number plate automatically or by looking at the logo, they will get the make of the car or by looking at the car, they'll get the color of the car, anything. Here, you don't need a HD image, basically. You don't have to compute or spend a lot of time and money on hardware onto this. Reduce the image and then compute onto this. This could be a very simple application. Okay. So this is your auto encoder. Good. There is one more dimensional reduction technique. I'm not sure if you guys have heard about it. Have you heard about TSNE? Uh, no part of supervised learning no yes or no no right okay let me know if you guys are interested i will show you something on this also it's yeah, not sure. a part of our uh, course anyway but uh, it is i feel it's a little important sometimes so let me show you first of all why we need tsne and where and all in deep learning you will need it so Something off the track, huh? not, not, not as a part of our course. This is what we do in industry. I don't want you guys to miss it. Say I have module number, uh, one minute. Huh? Yes, got it. Okay, so it is a part of um, NLP. So I show something, I showed something extra to some of my batches. Now, if you look at computer vision, we saw today what all transferred learning can be done. That is VGG, ImageNet, LXNet, LeeNet and all. Same thing you can do it in your NLP also, where we already have some kind of encodings available, ready-made. So the first encoding that we can see here is a Glove. Another one could be, um, what do you say, Elmo. Uh, another one could be Word2Vec. So Word2Vec is developed by Google. So these are standard embeddings that we have. We'll directly import it and start using it. This is what we mean by uh, transfer learning. So again, it's an example. So what if I say that in our text, so what is this case study about us? We have got a huge text available with us. Now I want to know that, uh, uh, let us say, uh, uh, I want to predict something. So I will say the prince, today's prince will be tomorrow's question mark. Okay. So what, what we can do out of this? So I will say today, today's prince is tomorrow's dash. What is it? So obviously you guys will know, okay, prince is nothing but tomorrow it, he'll be a, a king. What if I remove the prince and say today's princess or today's uh, uh, king, queen will be tomorrow's what? We don't know. So this is used when you want to do some kind of prediction. Now, the, the best example I'll give you is LinkedIn. So when you are messaging on LinkedIn, you guys have observed now. So for example, if Harish sends me a message on LinkedIn, something. So it will give me some kind of tokens if you have seen it. It will first say, hi, Harish. Good morning, Harish. Uh, sure, depending on the data or what he's written on that, it, it, he also predict me, sure, we'll meet tomorrow or sure, I will do that or something. How do we get these predictions? We use something called RNN. Okay. We use RNN to do this. Now, what is RNN? It's a different network, recurrent neural network. We'll do an NLP anyway. But RNN auto uses, or we can sometimes auto use GloVe. GloVe is uh, uh, the, the way you did VGG and all in CV. In NLP, we can say a ready made network. So, this is called global uh, vectors, basically. And it is developed by Stanford uh, University. Now, what in this, what I do is I will show you. 
What if I want to predict what is the nearest encodings to King? So from our corpus, if you remember what is corpus, I've showed you our chatbot. Corpus is a set of huge data available to train your model. Okay. Now, what if I say, give me the top five words, one to six means five words, which are very near to King. So if you observe queen, monarch, prince, kingdom, and reign from our corpus he is able to find these are the five predictions, which one you want me to send. So I will say share the top three predictions always. Something like a recommendation system I can say for text. All right. Now why do, why am I showing you this? Because here, if I want to represent this, what if this, this, this is all back end. I am not, I'm sure you guys wouldn't have understood what is the data? What is it? What is he talking about? If I want to represent this, what if I represent my tokens from my corpus? Are you able to visualize this? Not very great, but you are able to see that. Yes, there are some words which are tightly packed. That means they are very near to each other. There are some words which are almost away, but yes, they are nearer. So if you can observe university and college, okay, school and education, hospital and health, you can observe that these words are tagged together. Now, if you ask me how, that's again a different topic, how I tag them together, but glove will help me to do it. Okay. So how I represented this, how did I convert a higher dimension image to a 2D image like this? We use TSNE over there. So let me go to TSNE. What is TSNE? A very simplistic way. It is a supervised learning dimensional reduction technique. So far we have done unsupervised learning dimensional reduction technique that is PCA, right? In this case, what we'll do is we will say there is a 2D data and we have got four points, say one, two, three, four. I will say this is point number A, this is point number B, point number C, point number D. Now I'll say the distance between, okay, let me not give the answer now. I will ask you guys, what are the similarity measures that you have seen so far? Guys, how I can find similarity between four points? For sign similarity. Distance. For sign similarity, Pearson similarity and distance. This works majorly. Okay. So in this case, let me, let, let me say that I'm saying distance could be one of the similarity matrices. So I will say for our convenience, I will say each one of them is at a unit distance from each other. And the diagonal elements will be a distance of square root of two from each other. Agreed? Pythagoras theorem. Yeah. Now, how would I reduce the dimension? Let me ask you, I want to reduce the dimension to 1D. How should I do it? So to do that, okay, let me not ask you, let me show you something, then I'll ask you. To do that, what I will do is I'll pick up a point of reference. Let us say I'll start with A. I'll put A over here. Now, next to A, what do we have? We have B, oh, sorry, we have B here at a unit distance. And we have D at a unit distance. So now if I say the distance between A, D and B. So now we are kind of close. So if I keep distance in my mind and if I replicate them on a 1D space, I can transform them like this. Now, please remember how am I transport? I'm transporting. I'm saying that I will make sure that I don't change the distances. And right now, the similarity matrix between all of them is distances. So I have maintained distances between A, B and D. Agreed? Everybody agrees to that? Now, what about C? Where should I place my C? What if I place it here? Because if you remember, the distance between D and C is 1. Correct? And the distance between A and C is also square root of 2. So if I place it here, if this is C, what is going to happen? B and C is going to be far away. Whereas B and C is, going, is kind of 1 itself here. So what if I place C here? Now it's satisfied, but now D will be an issue. So A is anyway satisfied with both of them, but D and B are creating some issue for C. So this is a problem if we take this configuration, okay? This brings us to the end of this computer vision tutorial. Now, before you guys sign off, I'd like to inform you folks that we have launched a completely free learning platform called Great Learning Academy, where you have access to free courses such as AI, cloud, and digital marketing. So guys, thank you very much for attending the session and have a great learning ahead.